There's a problem. What?
fucking our sound guy. So we don't know when. It's gonna get better. Let's try and get into a better spot, yeah? Are you 100% sure? Are you 100% sure that this is Tingana? I'm just getting a different vibe from him. What about that pink nose? Convinced, convincent, convincent, my boy key. Oh no, oh no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, good afternoon, James. I am back on Juma Channel. I am on Arethusa Parallel Road North, just north of Knobthorne Red Dam Road. Copy, good afternoon, Scott. Thank you very much for the update. Copy, no problem. Uh, confirm static or is he on a bumper? He's static, full bellied, no sign of a bumper. All right, copy, thank you. Copy. We've been having some tech difficulties this afternoon, clearly, as I'm sure you are all aware. But that is not an issue because we have got this beautiful big male leopard in front of us. It looks like Tingana to me, although I don't know why. For some reason, I'm picking up the vibe that it isn't actually him. I don't know if it's the pink nose that I haven't noticed in the past or just a slightly different look to his face. But you guys can let me know your thoughts. I don't know why, like I said, I'm getting that feeling. Maybe I'm just going crazy, which is possible. My name is Scott, for those of you who have yet to meet me before. And I am teamed up with Dave on camera. We got incredibly lucky to find this leopard, and we've got a big thank you to say to the birds. There was a whole host of birds sitting in the trees just above him, alarm calling. And isn't it funny how timing is, is so crucial out here? We were going to drive along this road anyway, so we probably would have seen him. But there's a chance we wouldn't have. And before we even turned onto this road, I could hear the birds alarm calling, and I could actually see two forktail drongos flying in this direction. And I thought, here we go, we've got something. This is going to be something cool, possibly a snake. That's actually what I thought it was. I wasn't expecting uh, a big male leopard to be lying at the base of the bush, but we'll definitely take that. Looks like he's well fed. You can see his belly's quite rounded, and he's panting quite heavily. That's probably for a number of reasons. It's not only because he's got a full belly, it's also quite warm. Despite the cloud cover, it's about 26 degrees Celsius, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, coupled with 
The fact that there's a lot of meat pushing up against his diaphragm means that he's going to be taking short, sharp breaths. Now, I'm just going to have to keep the radio on for a while. You'll hear some crackles coming through from there. It's the Game Drive channel so that I can help people into the sighting. There is a limit to three vehicles per sighting. So I think what we'll do is, because it sounds quite busy across here on Arethusa this afternoon, we'll let guys come through once we've had a decent look and then aim to come back a little bit later. We are very close to the border with Juma, and I'm hoping he's going to continue on to Juma, and that will leave the masses behind and allow us to enjoy some time with him. So that is something we'll have to ready ourselves for. Great, well, we are on a live interactive safari. If you'd like to send either myself, Scott, any questions, or James, who you're about to meet on the other vehicle, it's very simple. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wilderearth.tv. And we love to hear from you, so please let us know, especially if this may be your first live safari. Get a hold of us, and if you haven't met James before, you'll be heading across to his vehicle right now. Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to this end of the safari where we are looking at a beautiful female kudu. I am so pleased that Scott has found a cat, a large spotted golden pelaged cat with a full belly. Wonderful news for the afternoon. My name is James Hendry. On camera today we have got Viam. Say hello Viam. Hello. There we go. Now Viam is... <laughs> filming as you can see he's full of beans this morning this afternoon and our plan was to check around this area to see if we could also find some leopard tracks I think we're going to maintain that plan but there will be lots of other little wonders on the way we had some Franklins here there were those kudu and there were also some zebra just off over there they have since disappeared unfortunately I know you won't believe me but we also had some warthogs it's been a great and abundant afternoon so far now the arrangement is precisely the same as it is on Scott's vehicle um, we're live and therefore we'd like you to talk to us hashtags of Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv on the email. Otherwise, speak to us on the Ustream chatty type thing. Uh, we're going to continue down the road here, see if we can find further tracks of the leopard. But while, as they say, the sun is shining, let us make hay. Even though there isn't any sun, let's go back and spend some time with Tingana. I will see you shortly. So I'm not too sure what got his attention, but he... He's just poked his head up. Obviously nothing too important because he's just plunked his head right back down. Now, it is impossible to predict what exactly he is going to do next. There is a strong chance that he does have a kill nearby and he's just come up into this kind of open sandy patch because it's nice and cool here. It's not uncommon for, for leopards to stray 50 or even 100 meters away from their kills. So he could lead us back to that later, or he could just continue on on his missions and really looking to forward to seeing what he does do. I was just saying to David, uh, it's nothing better than spending a full three hours with a leopard, and that's something he hasn't done yet. Janet M., thank you very much for helping me be sure that this is, in fact, Tingana. You have given the thumbs up there. So thank you for that. And if any of you are new to this live safari experience, it's important to know that you too could also, like Janet M, become experts in trying to understand which leopard is which. Initially, they all look the same. Um, and to me, clearly, they still do because I battle to distinguish them. But you can tell diff them apart. They've got little spot patterns that are all slightly different to one another. His pink nose is characteristic. That's one thing I didn't realize in the past. So whoops but also the small spotted whiskers that the whiskers are growing out of. Just above that, you can see he's got two freckles that are kind of almost joining, and then another two closer towards his nostrils. So those are distinctive of the right-hand side of his muzzle. Happy to hear that James Richards was also confused by the pink nose. Glad we're in the same boat there, James, making me feel better about my lack of awareness for that 
usually it's it's younger males that will have pink noses, but it's not a set rule. Well, wonderful. Ah, funky kawaii. You would like to know how far away is the leopard from the closest waterhole? And had you have asked me this question four days ago, um, it would have been applicable and useful because we hadn't had a, whole, a huge downpour of rain. But two or three nights ago we did, and there are puddles of water everywhere. So it's not really applicable where the closest water hole is because there are so many places that he can drink. Like I said, in very small little wallows, little round ponds, you could say, that are created by animals like warthog and, and buffalo that will roll around in the mud, thus creating deeper and deeper depressions that the rain can fill up. So um, it, it, it is nearby, though. It is about 500 meters in that direction to our west. It's called Red Dam. I'll even be able to show you where it is, but I don't expect that we are going to be seeing much action at the water holes now that there are so many latent puddles all around. So I'm going to zoom out and give you a, a kind of idea of where we are uh, on Juma and Arethusa. The right-hand square is Juma. The left-hand square is Arethusa. The blue dot is where we are. So we're on the boundary. This is a road that's the boundary between these two properties that we can traverse. We are the little blue dot over there. And as I zoom in, you can see Red Dam is directly to our west. So that is the closest. There will be some water in it after the rains, but I don't uh, foresee him having to go that far. There's probably a puddle closer by that he'll be happy with. Good. It's one thing that we've been incredibly lucky with this summer, that water holes have been so busy, because usually that's not a benefit of the summer. Usually that is a winter benefit when it's our dry season, but it is a drought at the moment, so that's why we are getting the, uh, the benefits of a dry winter. Catherine, you'd like to know if pink noses are a uh, kind of, oh, how could I have forgotten the word, a characteristic of younger male leopards? And I, yes, I think as a general rule, both lion and leopard, uh, they are, when they are younger, they'll have pink noses, and that will, as a general rule, darken as they become older. It's not cast in stone, though, which is clear in this instance because he's coming on nine or ten years old. So he's in his prime. Uh, probably another five years, uh, six years would, would be the maximum that he would survive for if he, if he has a really good innings. Uh, kind of anywhere from 12 to, to 15 or 16 would be considered a, a good innings for a big male leopard. So he's been around and he's certainly not a youngster. in Chicago, you'd like to know how far away this leopard is from where we saw the unknown leopard just the other day. And I'll ask Dave to zoom in again. We saw that unknown male leopard right in the top northeastern corner of Juma, over here. So far away uh, in regards to how far we can move but it's actually not far away regarding how far leopard can move. Tingana at this stage basically occupies, let me just move the screen a little bit. Tingana basically at this point occupies this entire territory, including the green portions where we cannot go. It's like the whole of Arethusa and Juma roughly, but we haven't seen them that much on our northern boundary, nor have not have we seen him much in this northeastern corner, but he has gone kind of further east of, of central Juma. So he's been seen going into Torchwood, but further south. So it's not a perfect square, how we might, might like to think it. It's like a, a, a strange shape, not, 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 not any straight angles, which is kind of how humans' brains work. There's sections that may not be his, that are on our property and other portions that are. So it appears like this other male is probably occupying just the northern little section of Juma, 
up to Buffalo Dam. And the reason why we don't see him that much there is because he's skittish, I guess, so he's probably hiding from us a lot of the time. There is a strong chance that uh, him and Tingana have met up and had discussions regarding their property. Um, but again, there's so much that we don't know that happens here. Um, and that is something we all need to remember, is that simply because we don't see it, it doesn't mean things aren't happening. We are spending a minute amount of time out here daily, uh, especially considering there's so many different animals that we divide our time amongst. So there are massive chunks of these animals' lives that we do not know about, and people just kind of assume that nothing's going on while we're not with them. But there are. There's a lot going on, and probably a lot of the interesting stuff that does go on is after dark when we are fast asleep. So. Um, it's something very important to remember, that these guys could be meeting up a lot more than we expect them to be. Hello, Sheila in London. You would like to know if there's any news on Shadow, which is one of Tingana's ladies. Um, there's basically two females that we get to see, one who occupies Arethusa, essentially, and one that occupies Juma, essentially. And the one who's on Juma is Karula, her daughter is Shadow, Tingana is both of their lover. So the mother and daughter are sharing a boyfriend, which is not uncommon in leopard world. And they actually share the same father as well. So interesting stuff <laughs> regarding that. But no, there hasn't been any word of Shadow for a long while. I haven't seen her or heard of her. So who knows what she's up to. I hope she's still well. I'm sure she is. She's probably just flying below the radar. Good. We're going to send you back to James for an update on how he's coming along, and we will catch up a little bit later. Right, we haven't found anything else, everybody. We did see a Birchall's Kukul, but it fluttered off before we could come across to you. And a Birchall's Kukul, I'm sure, will be on some of your lists, and probably on many, it probably isn't on many of the other lists. Now, while we're driving along, VM obviously gave you a relatively quiet and uninspiring hello. So I would just thought I would play you quickly um, a song that VM came up with the other night. Um, I'll just play you the first bit. It's called The Cheese Was Eaten by Louise. It goes like this. And you'll hear VM's vocal coming in now. The cheese was eaten by Louise. So would you tell me please what happened to the bees? Right, so I'm just going to reiterate the lyrics to that song there. The cheese was eaten by Louise, so would you tell me, please, what has happened to the bees? Liam? Yeah? Well done. Thank you, Jim. Now, we're on our way to Treehouse Dam. <laughs> and <laughs> with any luck, there will be something having a drink there. Now, Jack, you are in Romania. You're totally disinterested in VM's musical talent. Uh, VM, I think that says something. Um, maybe something you should take to heart. Um, Jack, you want to know about a vine snake, and is, it, is its venom harmful to human beings? Jack, absolutely it's harmful to human beings. A vine snake is probably the second most venomous snake in Africa, second only to its close relative, the tree snake or worm slung. And they have a venom called hemotoxic venom. And that means that when a vine snake bites you, it will cause your blood to cease its ability to coagulate. So it's got a very strong decoagulant, and of course that means that you would eventually start to hemorrhage from all orify. Your ears, your eyes, your nose, and everything else will start to, or will start to hemorrhage, and internally as well. Now that all sounds very terrible, which it would be if it were to happen to you, but there are two redeeming features of the vine snake and its venom. The first is that there is an impala there, but it doesn't want to look at us. The first is that a vine snake is shy, 
and also is back fanged, which means that for a vine snake to bite a human being, it's almost got to kind of take three or four bites before it can get its back fangs into you. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that the hematoxic venom, while incredibly powerful, is not very fast acting, which means if you were to get bitten by a vine snake, you could easily make it to a hospital where they would give you a blood transfusion. It would be a very serious a hospitalization, but you would probably survive. So, yes, Jack, but I mean, the chances of being bitten by a vine snake are very small. Touch wood. Thank you, Steph, very much for saying you enjoyed our song. Yes, well, Viam, there you go. You've got one fan, and you say we should make a Bush album. Well, perhaps that will happen one day. I it would go platinum. You think it would go platinum, do you? It would go platinum, do you? I think um, that's about as... Well, that's probably about as likely as me finding Karula this afternoon. Here is Treehouse Dam. You can see a beautiful mud wallow. If you happen to be a species that likes to wallow in the mud, this is ideal. And also, OK drinking, believe it or not. Muddy water like this, perfectly acceptable to most of the animals out here. The notable exception being the elephants. They don't like to drink this sort of stuff at all. UMP, there's a bird up top there. You see it there? I just want to see what it is. It looked like it might be a small sipeter. It is not. It is a fairly uninspiring red-billed oxpecker. Oh, well. Shall we carry on? Nothing happening at Treehouse Dam. I must say, there's a wonderful kind of pleasant, peaceful Sunday afternoon feeling about the afternoon. And on Twitter, you want to know, Viam knows the cheese comes from cows and not from Louise. Viam, did you know that? Uh, yes. You did know that? I see. Oh, from bees. Right, I see. Yes. Did you know it didn't come from bees? Uh, mm -hmm. He did. OK, good. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for checking with that. I'm not sure where his uh, lyrics came from there, to be honest. The cheese was eaten by Louise, so could you tell me, please, what happened to the bees? I mean, I'm not sure that that sort of lyric would ever have made it onto a Dylan album, for example. What have you even listened to a Dylan album? <laughs> I have many. OK, let's go back to the leopard with Scott while we continue our search towards twin dams. Okay, everyone. Well, you are very fortunate to have heard Viam on vocals there. Wasn't that a masterpiece of a melody? So happy that you had that as your, a portion of your change of scenery with James. Speaking of changes of scenery, it appears like there is a huge demand for the guides and their guests to come and see Mr. Tingana. There are already three vehicles making their way here directly and already five on standby to come in afterwards. Um, so we are going to make space for those guys as soon as they get here in the hope that if he does get mobile, I've got a feeling he is going to head on to Juma when he does. It's going to leave all those vehicles behind where they cannot come on to Juma. So we'll be unlucky and we'll, we'll be able to enjoy, continue enjoying the sighting alone or with the one or two other vehicles. Um, but basically, yeah, the, that's the update. We're going to have probably another five or ten minutes here before we need to move off. But they will call us back as soon as he does get mobile and head on to Juma and or once everyone's had a look, we could possibly come back. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, boy, we're just north of parallel north-south junction and Nobthorn Red Dam Road, whichever one it is. Thank you. Hello to Tula, who would like to know if there's been any recent signs of Mvula, who is basically the dominant male who used to occupy Juma. This individual here has, in the last year, pushed them further and further east. So now we don't see Mvula anymore. It's not to say he doesn't come on to Juma and we've missed him, but he does definitely not spend nearly as much time uh, with us as he used to. So not too sure how he's doing. The last I heard, though, he was looking quite thin. 
He is getting a bit old, and I think he is, sadly, on the way out. But I guess that's life, you know, for every living being on the planet. So um, I'm guessing we're not going to see Mvula too much more on Juma. And it's this guy and this other young male we saw the other day that I think are going to be taking his place. And that's the reason why I also think that we might get to see him coming more east onto Juma this afternoon when he does in fact get mobile. I don't think he's visited us since he was mating with Tandi on our property, which was just over a week ago. We last saw him last week, Saturday night. There are, since then, we have not seen him. And I think since then, he's been doing the rounds in the western portion of his property. And now he's going to head back onto Juma to continue monitoring his land and making sure there are no intruders, which it appears there is, that young male in the northeast. And hopefully we'll get to see some interactions between them. It's something very rare to see the, uh, male leopards or any leopards interacting, really. So that's something to hope for. Hello, Ramey, who is assuming that uh, the belly of Tingana is filled with dica or steenbuck and is therefore asking whether there is an abundance of those two small antelope in this area. I wouldn't say there's an abundance of dica or steenbuck, but I think the population is fairly healthy. Uh, interesting that you assume that it's one of those two species that are in his belly. I've never seen him with either uh, of those two animals. So, and, and, and to be honest, I don't think it's actually his favorite prey. That's suited more for a female leopard, and that's in my history of, of all male leopards. Male leopards prefer bigger prey, uh, and or warthogs are, are a typical prey of male leopards. They can patiently lie waiting on a termite mound, waiting for warthogs to exit early in the morning and pounce on them. So they are warthog professionals as a general rule. This guy's been seen eating four or five aardvark, and uh, not quite recently, but there was a stage over a few months where he was really walloping them. So again, an indication of how a male will specialize in ambush ambushing prey that have to exit burrows, aardvark and the warthog, and bigger prey. So it is not to say that he didn't catch a dike or a steenbuck, but I have never seen him with one. What are you full of, Tingana? Maybe there's some leftovers. Maybe you can show us them a bit later on, but time will tell. Like I said, it's not uncommon for leopards to stray 50 to 100 meters away from their kill, especially if they know it's stashed up in a tree safely away from hyena. And they'll do that so that they can come across into a comfortable spot. Oh, speaking of prey items that this individual likes to feed on, it sounds like James has found some for you. Now, everybody, just quickly, I know you don't have long with Tingana left, but this Warthog is showing desperate signs of, as Vian puts it, the um, a sign of the economy, really. And it is a sign of the economy out here. The drought has taken its toll on this old warthog sow. Her baby looks okay. All the other warthogs haven't looked too bad, but we do know that warthogs are the first animals to be affected by drought. They cannot move to water. They don't have the legs for it. They don't have the physiology for it. And certainly we are quite a long way from any fixed water. So, I don't know, I mean, she looks really dreadful. It's very sad to see, but I, I wonder if there isn't some disease involved as well. I can't believe that that's purely the drought, simply because she's the only warthog I've seen that looks like that. And that's sad. Thankfully, the piglet seems to be purely on grass at the moment. A nice question there coming from the final control. Could it be because of her age? I don't think it's an age thing, you know, because she's got a young piglet there. And I don't think that an old warthog that looked like that, she certainly wouldn't have been in that condition when she gave birth. If you look at the side of her skin, I wonder if we can't see some kind of disease on there or if that's just mud. No, it is just mud. She might be old. 
But she was no, I mean, she's lost all of the muscle definition on her body. Everything's gone. She's not lactating anymore, definitely not lactating. So that little piglet will be purely on grass. That looks to me like she's sick. I don't know what she'd have. She missing her ear there, Vian? She's, no, no, she hasn't. She's got it. Isn't that interesting? All right, let's head back across to Scott. Just as we do that, though, I don't think the leopard's going anywhere. I just want you to quickly look at the um, grey go-away bird. I saw this bird in the same tree a few days ago, Gymnosporia senegalensis, or the red spike thorn. I'm going to go and try and discover which part of the tree the bird is eating. I've never seen any other birds eating it. While I do that, let's go back across to the magnificent Tingana. Shame, I wonder what's wrong with that warthog. Interesting stuff, possibly old age. Possibly a sickness, like James says. And, of course, the sad thing is, is that she's got that little piglet that she still needs to raise. So, tough times. It's actually surprising we haven't seen too many animals that are really clearly showing the effects of the drought. That's obviously not to say that they aren't. Maybe it's difficult for our human eye to note the differences and hardships that these animals are facing in terms of just looking at their physical condition. But it is going to be a time of plenty for the predators. They certainly will be noticing that the prey is a little bit more slow, not as responsive as they would be if they were full-bellied. Ah, this is interesting. One of you has spotted a heart on its belly. And it's just about perfect. That's Joanne in Arizona. Hello, Joanne. Now, I'm going to put my finger into the screen and try and work out, at least attempt to. Oh, here we go. There's my finger. Is that the one, Joanne? I'm guessing that is the one. That's the one that looks like heart to me, although the one to the right over there also looks like quite a good heart. Both of those two there next to one another are decent. I don't know what you guys think is the best, but seeing as though Joanne is the one that has initially seen it, it's either... One of those two, I'm guessing. Bing, bing. And aren't we so lucky to be viewing an animal of this beauty in the wild at such close proximity, having a snooze, completely relaxed, as if we are not even here. And for those of you who were with VM and myself when we saw that skittish male leopard who was acting kind of as a regular leopard would, most leopards in most wilderness areas that you would go to in the wild will behave like that. They'll be incredibly nervous of people and you'll only get a fleeting glimpse of them. To be honest, he actually wasn't even that nervous. I've seen leopards that are far, far more skittish than he was. He was kind of medium, so nothing too serious. Well, we've got our first visitor. Roy is arriving with his guests and that's good that we can start sharing this wonderful sighting with him. Good. Roy's just going to sneak past quickly to get into a good spot, so we're going to lose a view intermittently, but that's perfect. He's just trying to get into a position that will allow more vehicles to get into this quite thick area. Hello, Big Dave in Florida. You would like to know what has happened to Karula's cub? There was one confirmed sighting of a tiny little fur ball, you say, about three weeks ago. And my thoughts, Big Dave, is that they are dead. Or well, it, at least, is dead. There was also rumors that Shadow, Karula's daughter, also had a cub, and that one, too, I think, is also dead. When a leopardess has a cub, it's usually quite easy to follow her movements. She goes backwards and forwards into the same area wherever she's denning those cubs. And even though the den site may change, her pathways and movements will always be leading back into one given area, which we have not noticed. And unless it's highly unlikely, I think, that we've been missing all of those tracks, I think the 
sad but realistic news is that the cubs are dead and leopards will lose cubs a lot of the time. The majority of cubs that leopards give birth to will not make it to adulthood. It's just like the majority of leopard hunts or lion hunts that they attempt will end up unsuccessful, so will raising the cubs. It could have been that this male leopard killed his own cubs. I'm told he's been confused in the past and killed cubs that he almost certainly had fathered with shadow. And maybe that's happened again. No one would be able to sp explain that, of course, except for him. Or it could have been this other male that we got to see the other day at Buffalzook Waterhole. He's been flying below the radar, and maybe he came across Kula with cubs that he wasn't uh, comfortable that he had fathered. Maybe it was a hyena. Possibly python consumed the cubs. Either way, I think they are gone, sadly. So we have to wait another three or four months before the next round of cubs begins. Hello, Kitty Bang Bang. You would like to know if there's any results that have come through from an organization called Panthera regarding the leopard scat, the leopard poop uh, that uh, the guys had been collecting, sending through for DNA tests. No, um, I think it's going to be a while until we get any results from them regarding that. So, um, yeah, sadly, we just have to sit tight and wait patiently for them to get back with, uh, to us with some information. It's going to be really interesting, though, if they can work out the kind of paternal uh, lineages, lineages of who's who and which father was which and how kind of bloodlines have flowed, which they will be able to. And in an area like the Sabi Sands, where there are so many guides on a daily basis going out, keeping quite close tabs on the leopard of the area, there's going to be some interesting research and information that comes with that. So certainly something to look forward to, but I don't have a clue when it's going to come out. nice cool weather today. I also really enjoyed my siesta today. My room is ordinarily like a pizza oven if the sun is shining, so enjoying the cloudy weather. Very easy to sleep. And you can see he is also really savoring this. Oh, she's how could I have forgotten? Although I was sleeping smoothly today, or soundly, I was very, very rudely awakened by a tree squirrel, and you wouldn't believe it, in the middle of my sleep, fast asleep, I'd probably been asleep for about half an hour or 45 minutes, and I felt this sharp, biting sensation tearing into my calf, and I got the fright of my life. My first thought was rat. Why, I don't know, I thought it was a rat. I just had this feeling, but something was biting into my calf, and it turned out to be a tree squirrel that had jumped onto my bed while I was asleep, and latched its little teeth into my calf. Um, it didn't draw blood, but I, I felt my leg as expecting there to be blood there, and it just jumped off my bed and ran off. Nikki thought it was the funniest thing that's ever happened, so she continued laughing, I think, until beyond when I fell back to sleep again. <laughs> but can you believe it? It's a squirrel biting you on the leg. I mean, what was it thinking, taking a bite out of such a ginormous creature or thing, especially considering it's supposed to be a herbivore? Who knows? Anyway, that's what happened today. And that was a first for me. Ambushed by a squirrel. And speaking of the culprits, it sounds like James has just found some for you. Now, everybody, we don't have a leopard for you, but we've got a rodent. Now, as you know, Scott Dyson was attacked mercilessly today by one of these. They look so cute and sweet that butter wouldn't melt in their mouths, and yet the courage to have taken on a human being the size of Scott Dyson today while he slumbered restfully. Hmm. Vicious, vicious. I think these are young ones, actually, and I think you'll find that their little nest is just inside there. They don't look like adults. There are three of them. One of them went scuttling up 
the tree. He clearly felt a little bit shy about being on camera. And those two, I think, are just kind of taking a load off, really. They're probably just coming out, enjoying a bit of warmth before going back inside as the sun goes down. Aren't they sweet? One of them's very tired. You can see the top one. I, heavy eyes. Heavy Sunday afternoon eyes. He's thinking of school tomorrow and not feeling very happy about it. We don't have to go to school tomorrow, do we, Vian? Nope. Monday will be the same as Sunday. And Wednesday. And Wednesday. OK, so that's the... Those are the squirrels. And we'll just keep an eye on them before we do anything else. This is the tree that the grey go away bird was eating. And it is Gymnosporia senegalensis, like I say. And what I was seeing was that the bird was just eating the tips off the leaves, just like that. And I looked it up in my book, and um, it didn't tell me anything about animals wanting to eat it at all. It apparently can be used for all sorts of ailments, including earaches, sore throats, and venereal disease, if you happen to have that. And the roots are used as an aphrodisiac, believe it or not. But the I've also heard it used as an anesthetic. And them. There we go. And it does have a very numbing effect on the mouth. And so it's not surprising that it should be used as a general analgesic. Perhaps you've got a sore throat or uh, you have an earache. I'm not sure I'll put it in my ear, but probably quite good for any kind of general aches and pains. And I'm not sure what compound is in it that makes it do that. But I've never seen anything else eat it other than insects and that grey go away bird. VM. I'm extremely unimpressed by the taste of Gymnosporia senegalensis. Right, let's carry on along this road here and see what else we can find. Bye bye, little squirrels. Study hard at school tomorrow. We'll see you anon. Now, Debbie. You're on Twitter, and a very valid question. If that warthog has a disease and a predator ate it, could the predator get the disease? It would depend very much on what the disease was. So I'm trying to think of an obvious example. <clears throat> if it had, if it was carrying rabies, for example, and a predator ate it, then yes, the predator could definitely get it. If it was carrying some kind of parasite, though, maybe it's got some kind of intestinal parasite that's taking all its energy, then the predator wouldn't get it. So it really would depend on the disease. The disease, of course, the term disease can refer to all manner of things, to all of the pathogens, the viruses, the fungi, and the bacteria, and all sorts of other things that don't have any necessarily obvious cause. So it really would depend on the disease, Debbie. But what I think you'll find is that with a lot of predators, as with the herbivores, there are lots of things out here that are poisonous for animals to eat, and they don't eat them. But because over hundreds of millions of years of evolution, they've learned what to avoid and what not to avoid. And I think that's half the reason that we taste things the way we do. Things that taste bad to us are normally toxic in some way, and it's the same way, I think, for the herbivores out here, and I imagine very similar for a lot of the carnivores as well. <clears throat> so that's an interesting one, though. I, I think that I think that did have a disease. Yes. Now, Patricia Robinson, you're wondering about the rains that we've had, and will they improve the fact that that warthog will they improve the warthog's condition? because there's been a flush of green. Uh, Patricia, I don't know. It depends on why she's like that. If she's, if she's like that because of the drought, then absolutely it will bring her back. But you see, I haven't seen any other warthogs like that, so I'm not convinced it is the drought that's made her like that. Unless, as Leanne suggested, maybe she's very old, and therefore the drought just took its toll on her before it took on others. In which case, yes, the fresh green sprouts will make a difference. And Leanne, you want to know, uh, not Leanne, Patricia, you also want to know how, how long warthog piglets stay with their mothers. 
Well, the young females will probably stay with them almost for life. They'll form a little sounder together. They will then kind of drift off probably when they have their first litter at the age of probably 18 months to two and a half years. The males would be sexually mature probably at about two and a half years and then they will probably slowly drift off again, firstly in a little group of males and then they'll probably become slightly more solitary as they look for mating opportunities. Now we're on Ledwood Road heading for the eastern sector and we'll from there head north to where Viam found the Gajima the leopard last night. I would be extremely excited to see Gajima the leopard. Uh, that said, I'd be extremely excited to see any form of predatory animal right now. Not a lot going on on Leadwood Road at the moment. In the meantime, I'm not sure if Scott's still with his leopard or if he's not with his leopard anymore. But let's go across to him, get an update on his plans, and I'll catch up with you, hopefully, with some good news just now. OK, everyone, we've just brought you back for a quick goodbye. Hopefully not for the whole of the Sunset Safari. I'm hoping we are going to get to see him again, and I'm confident we will. But let's say goodbye for now and make space for the other two vehicles who are just around the corner. And there's some good news. We are not leaving here without a plan. There's another big dominant male leopard called the Anderson male. He's a brute. He's bigger than Tingana. And they found some of his tracks on the western boundary. Goodbye, everyone. On the western boundary of Arethusa. So that's the plan. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hello, Ryan. Good. Good. Guys, I know you're all very excited to see Ryan. It's not often you get to see him. So, there we go. How's it going, guys? <laughs> Where are you off to from here, Scott? We're going to go and find Anderson Mail. Okay. There's Nyari and all the teachers down here. Thank you very much. Good to see you. I'll get in touch soon. Cheers, guys. Have fun. Sounds good. You see, it's always good fun when we can pin down Ryan like that, get the camera right into his face, because he very often bullies me and tells his guests when we're not live that I used to be part of a South African boy band called the Front Street Boys. That's one of the lines he likes to use. <laughs> he often uh, terrorizes me and then goes and hides behind a bush. Hello, Christy. In Indiana, you would like to know if Shadow has in fact lost her cubs. That is what you've heard. I think it's possible that she has. And secondly, you'd like to know if it is because she has been mating with her father. She hasn't been mating with her father. Uh, Tingana is the male she's been mating with, along with a few others, but I believe her father is dead. I can't remember the name of him, but her father is actually also the father of Shadow, her mother. Bizarre. Um, so, Shadow and her are both mother and daughter, as well as kind of half-sister, through the same father. Um, so, no, I don't think anyone knows why exactly Shadow has been unfortunate to lose her most recent litter. So that's that. Um, now, I know I've just told you guys that we all think Karula has lost her cubs. And I've just got some information that says that we are wrong. Again, I am going to stress, unless we see something for ourselves, it is best not to believe it. But if you would like to, you are welcome to. I'm just going to furnish you with some information that I've just got from Roy. He apparently saw Karula four days ago. He is under the impression that she did have suckle marks and that she is still, in fact, looking after cubs. So there is hope. And I guess that is the beauty of being on a live safari. You simply do not know what is going to happen and or when it is going to happen. And the professionals who drive you around can often be wrong. I just thought I saw possibly one of Tingana's 
tracks here, the leopard we've just seen, but it wasn't. So I was hoping we were going to be able to show you a paw prints. Good, we're going to send you back to James who's found some birds. I laugh, everybody, because Viam, of course, was in full song by the time that link came along. There we have a magpie shrike. And, well, they're very common around here, of course, but on this peaceful Sunday afternoon, they just seem to be sitting just like those squirrels were, sort of overlooking the place and enjoying the peace of this balmy afternoon. There's also a young one, I think. Oh, no, it seems to be attacking something now. <laughs> Two of them there with a hornbill. The reason I say they're young is that their their tails are not quite as long as those of adults. And there's also there's that hornbill there. Let's just have a look at him. I think there must be some termites on the ground here coming out of the ground, and that's why they're all around here. That, that, that hornbill is also a juvenile. Very short beak, just like the young magpie shrikes, and I'm sure they're just having a bit of a fight. Oh, look at that. Now, that's not just a dust bath. Oh, sorry, let's go straight across to Scott. He's got some buffalo. Well, we've got a big Cape Buffalo Bullier who's just come down to the waterhole and he is making the most of it. Look at this. Yeehaw. The breakdance rodeo is what I like to call that. And it is the one time that these big cantankerous short fused old boys can look quite playful. And they really do love submerging themselves in this thick, cool mud. It will, you can see how he's rubbed his horns in it. That was the first thing he did on arrival. And it's creating, obviously, a, initially a soothing effect, but now it's going to be coating those horns in this thick clay-like mud, which will prevent any parasites that feed on their horn. Or the horn bore moth. Oh, is that a yawn? Oh, tiring business. Oh, yeah. Horn, a, a yawn slash burp, it appears. And this is a great way for them to keep parasites off them, like I say. And he's probably going to now try and submerge the other half of his body in this mud. He's only done his right side, so let's see if he doesn't try and get the left side catered for. Mike Sandmeyer, you are interested to know if the animals carry any diseases that remain dormant until drought conditions kick in. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I do know, though, that during droughts, there is a far larger risk of anthrax being kind of, you could say, rekindled out of dried up mud wallows. How exactly that works, I'm not too sure. I've never been in a drought before, but there's no diseases that I know of. That will be... Oh, <laughs> look at this! <laughs> that was incredible. That took me by a huge surprise. I've never, ever seen a Cape Buffalo behave like that before. That is a first, and I've spent many an hour watching these boys roll around in the mud. But he is really going for it. Can you believe it? The bucking bronco over here. I love the way you can see the white in his eye when he really extends his neck as far as he can. P. 
Pete in the UK, also on the topic of diseases, you're wondering if that little piggy is suffering from anthrax. I do not have a clue. Um, I don't think even a vet would have a clue just looking at it. It could be one of a number of problems, and unless you were to do some proper tests on it, I don't think anyone would be able to tell you the answer to that. But again, I'm no professional when it comes to diseased animals. The only one I have seen is a domestic dog, which had rabies. That is the only one and only time I've seen an animal with a disease or virus. <laughs> Deborah, the armchair traveler, you are right. It's hilarious how humans will pay hundreds of dollars for this kind of treatment and health spas around the world getting mud applied onto their faces, whereas the Cape Buffalo get it free of charge here in the Sabi Sands. It's a pit. of lives it feels like that was a couple of months back now we've got some good news from time to time when an awesome sighting or event occurs we will play back a slow motion video and this buffalo bill i think has got the first buffalo slow motion video ever to be shown to you enjoy I'm sure that was awesome to watch. I'm jealous that I didn't get to see it. I don't get that uh, feed coming through to my vehicle, but I hope you enjoyed the slow motion brucking bronco, seeing mud flying in all directions. We're probably going to move on, and it's funny how it happens when it rains, it pours, and as much as I've been loving the sighting, I don't think it's going to get much better than what we've seen, and there are monkeys alarm calling in the general area where the other vehicles are following up on some other male leopard tracks. It is of a male leopard that we've so seldomly seen. If we can see both him and Tangana in one day, it will be a small miracle. So let's go and try. It's a gamble, but I think it's worth it. And Cat and Tampa, you're right, what an awesome buffalo sighting. It's seldom that you get to see them in this playful kind of mood. So thank you for that. Even seeing those yawns of his, those yawny burps, that was something else as well. Okay. Looks like he's got a friend coming to join him at the mud wallow. We'll leave them to it. and venture forth in the hopes of finding another huge male leopard. Joel, you are interested to know whether on top of helping to uh, contain parasite loads on their body, will mud wallowing also be used to help disguise their scent? from animals like lion that will be trying to hunt them. And no, I don't think it will. I think it's purely the parasites that it's gonna help keep at bay, not the lions. The same goes to say for the lions. If lions were to roll around in buffalo dung, it's only going to create a cocktail of smells. It's not going to purely remove the scent of lion. And I think the animal's senses are just so much better than ours that we, yeah, that they, that they can distinguish between two different smells that may be intermixed, you could say. Jennifer in San Francisco, you are concerned about the vicious squirrel attack that I encountered whilst having my siesta today and thank you for your concern like I say it didn't draw blood had it have drawn blood there would have been a very small minute portion of me that would be concerned for a disease like rabies but I think I think I am up to date with rabies inoculations so they come in the clear there but worth double checking um, 
But the fact that it didn't draw blood makes me confident that there's uh, no, no serious uh, issues. Had it had have drawn blood, it would have been a different story. Angie in Wisconsin, yes, you are right. It's fascinating how awesome it is for us to actually see animals having fun and enjoying uh, the effects of the rain. First, it was the hyena with Sam running around wildly, enjoying that mud wallow at Treehouse Dam. And now the Cape Buffalo we've got to see. It's a pity there aren't too many elephants around at the moment because they too will definitely be making the most of these muddy conditions. I'm driving a little bit faster than normal and that is to try and get into this general area where basically one vehicle found some leopard tracks of another big male heading north and then another vehicle who was heading into that area to help lend a hand started hearing some monkeys alarm calling in the direction of where those tracks were heading. So all the pieces of the puzzle are indicating that there is a chance that the, this other big male called Anderson is nearby. And I've been spending a lot of time recently patrolling this western boundary of Arethusa, which is the one place where he does come onto it. It's the one area of our traverse where he does move. He, to the majority of his property is further south and west away from us. So we only get very small windows of opportunity to catch him, and it sounds like this is one of them. Oh, oh this Cape Buffalo that we've just bumped into, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get a view of it. I just want to try and pick the best spot. He's now stopped directly behind the bush. Let's just creep forward. He's got some decorations that he's wearing, and it's funny how such a brute of a beast can decide to wear jewelry. Let's stop here he's about to move through this little gap and then we'll get to see his fancy outfit come on boy you've got all dressed up unveil yourself oh yeah come on there it is oh no he's a little bit shy and embarrassed there we go you can see he's got some kind of an earring or a wig under his left ear Let's see if we can't oh there we go very fancy it's a kind of a less is more outfit i guess not too much to see there but nice to see he's getting dressed up maybe he knows he's about to have a meeting with the inkuhuma ladies you are not too far away they're basically north of where we are now on sibambili property where we cannot traverse but there's a chance that they're going to come back a little bit further south and or east onto Juma tonight. Okay so we are approaching the area of where I'm going to need to be extremely focused. All my senses, mainly my ears and my eyes though, um, trying to hear alarm calls or any kind of sounds that will lead us closer to the leopard that is lurking through this general area. And while we do that, we are going to send you across to James and VM to see what they are getting up to. Well, that's very hopeful of Scott. If he finds the Tingana male and the Anderson male, well, that will be quite a drive. We have found, Vim, what have we found since we last were on air? Franklin. A Franklin, well done. We found a cape, not a cape, a Natal Franklin. It was calling, singing very beautifully. It stopped, of course, before you came across and went away. We've checked Bufflesook Dam. There isn't anything there except quite a lot of mud. So now we're hoping to find that leopard that Viam spotted yesterday on this very road. Was it not Viam? No. No. Not Bufflesook East? No. It's a bank in the road. Ah. OK. Scott said it was Bufflesook East, so I'm going to assume it was this one. Anyway. Anyway. A very balmy afternoon, like I said, but there does seem to be quite a lot of grey cloud blowing in from the southeast. It's about 26 degrees, so still very pleasant. That in Fahrenheit is roughly 78, if I'm not mistaken. And like I say, I do just wish that uh, 
humanity would get it together enough to be able to use only one kind of system. <laughs> aged just eight, you have finally, finally come home and received Safari James, made by Viam and I. Well done, Viam. Uh, he made his way all the way from Bivelsrug Dam to Ohio, where he is now watching Safari, wondering how it is that he's come to be so far away from his, the place of his birth. Gracie, I'm very pleased that he's with you, and I apologize once again for the state of his limbs. I believe that his arms were not quite attached when he arrived. It was a long trip for him, Gracie, and I'm sure your mum will help him to fix it. And you also say you enjoyed our song very much, but that you want to know why on earth Viam thinks that cheese comes from bees when everyone knows that it comes from cows, and of course the bees like to drink nectar and sweat, I think you said. Well, they do sometimes like sweat, but that's normally a sweat bee. Um, I don't know, Gracie. Viam obviously went to a strange school, I think. Lactose bees. Lactose bees. Anyway, there's some dwarf mongoose up ahead. Let's see if we can get them. I'm very pleased that you've got Safari James now, Gracie. There was some dwarf mongoose that went running through here. Obviously, it's extremely thick, and so they were running away from me. Anyway. Hello, Brian in Toronto. You say you're coming to the Sabi Sands in May or June. And where do you need to stay in order to meet the crew of Safari Live? Arethusa or Juma? Well, Brian, um, I suspect, first of all, if you haven't booked yet, you'd better get on it very quickly because I know that these lodges get booked out very quickly. And the second thing to say is, Arethusa, if you're coming with a couple, if it's just you and a friend or you and a partner or whatever it is, then that's the best because Juma, you have to book out the whole camp. And if there are 10 of you, then it's the best value bed in the Sabi Sands. But unless there are 10 of you, you have to take out the whole camp. So it's just a little bit more difficult. So Arethusa, yes, probably a good idea to book there. Good, Brian. We look forward to meeting you. Uh, here's an interesting question. Now, uh, Dee and Richard, in the United Kingdom, you say, you're looking at that warthog, do animals get cancer in the same way that people do? And the answer, D, is probably not nearly as much. And there are a number of reasons for that. Of course, we know that there are genetic reasons why people get cancer. Um, but because of medical care, obviously those genes will survive within the, pop within the population. That is not the case in animals, of course. Then, secondly, animals live in the environment in which they evolved to live. So the triggers that set off cancers in human beings I strongly believe are brought about by the environment that we were not evolved to live in. We didn't evolve to live in cities with the pollutants that we have, with the foods that we eat. It's almost impossible to go to the shops and buy a food that is actually just a food without it being stuffed full of some kind of chemical or a GMO product or something or other. It's almost impossible. You don't even know half the time what you're eating. I certainly am often shocked when I looked, look at the packages of stuff that we eat. The animals out here, it's not the same for them. They are eating exactly what they evolved to eat. The warthogs are eating grass, the buffalo are eating grass, the leopards are eating warthogs, and the lions are eating buffalo. And that's what they evolved to do. Now, you might find that they contain in their genetic makeup those triggers in the same way that human beings do, but because they're not exposed to the same level of toxins that we are, 
it never expresses. So I suspect you'll find that it's nothing like as bad as it is in human beings. I've no doubt that that uncontrolled cell growth that is cancer does occur in the animal kingdom. I suspect, though, it will be far, far, far less frequent than it is in the human being. Very nice question. Thank you, Dean Richard. It's a really nice topic to discuss. And Angie in Wisconsin, I think this is a subject that deserves a lot further study and I don't think many people have studied it at all. You say, is there a plant perhaps that that hog could eat to get rid of parasites? I think that you, find, you would find if we studied it carefully, that animals do self-medicate. I'm pretty sure that they know to within reason what plants would help them with certain parasites. I see no reason why they should do that. And I've used this example before. I've seen an elephant take cambritum leaves and stuff them very specifically, taking specific cambritum leaves and putting them into um, a, a hole from where the tusk had fallen. So I don't see why there shouldn't be any reason why animals wouldn't select specific foods to try and get rid of parasites. And I've definitely seen, I mean, if you watch an elephant feeding, an elephant is extremely selective about what it eats. And I can't believe it's only doing that for taste. I'm sure it must know to with it. I mean, and I say no, I mean, physiologically must be aware as to what nutrients it needs and therefore it will select certain species based on the nutrients that it needs. Very nice question, thank you. Whether that hog or not will be able to survive the parasites that are within it, who knows? Very interesting indeed. And like I say, I think the whole subject of whether or not animals are able to self-medicate themselves uh, is a really good one, really fascinating one. Elephant. Uh, tail this elephant, Vim. This is an elephant going north into Bifosuk, everyone. Let's see if it is a, is a herd. Now, Vernie Moyo, while we do that, you want to know we get bushbuck here at the bushbuck, bush pig. You say they're very beautiful. They are beautiful indeed. We don't get them here. Well, we do get them here in theory, but I've never actually seen one here. Close relative of the warthog, the only other pig that we get. Where's this elephant? Do you see him? Ah, there he is. He's got no tail, Bian. And he's on his own. I'm trying to get away from me again. Stop, elephant. We'll just stop there. Anyway, just to prove that there are one or two mammals here. I can see as well. It's very odd with the tail there, and I suspect that that is a result of a tick infestation. Ticks probably managed to get in under the skin, and in so doing, they kind of ate away the flesh, and eventually, the tail would have just fallen off. It is quite unusual, though. Anyway, that's a young bull. He's heading north of the boundary into Bufflesok, so we can't follow him. We're going to go down here, which is Hyena Road, and Hyena Road is... Well, it's a good stomping ground for a number of leopards, including, hopefully, our new friend, Gajima, and perhaps some Vula. Just quickly, that elephant is now breaking something. He's, <laughs> he's picked himself a giant branch of Cumbretum to eat. That's the red bush willow, and that's normally the mainstay of the winter diet. But because there's so little grass, of course, it is now the mainstay of the late summer diet, too. <laughs> I hope the elephants will be able to graze a little bit in the wake of the rain that we've had. I think that you'll find that they need that balanced diet of grazing in the summer and browsing in the winter, because the grasses, of course, contain a completely different suite of nutrients to the trees. So they will be affected. And I think, I think the elephants, to be honest, are looking quite skinny. They all just look slightly less round than they normally do. They look to me like the desert elephants. If you ever go to Namibia and you see the elephants that live in the desert there, same elephant, but they've just adapted to living in desert climates, and they all look a lot leaner than the ones that we have here, which are normally quite round and tubby. I'm not sure I'd describe an elephant as tubby to its face. Would you, Vian? 
No. I don't think they will understand it. No, he probably wouldn't understand it, would he? Now, Vernie Moyo, I'm not sure if you heard me answer your question, but I, was, I did say just before we saw the elephant that the bush pig is found here, but that we don't see it very often. I've never seen one here, actually. Now, there's a diker. One should try and get excited about seeing a diker every so often. Let's just sneak past this. Gymnosporia buxifolia bush, and he's run away, diving into the bush. Ooh. You can see exactly there why he's called a diker, because he loves a lot of diving. Now, Matthew Putman, a very nice question from you about the dangers of being on safari. Matthew? Um, this is a question that we get asked quite a lot in various guises. Uh, for instance, this morning we had a lot of questions about giant cockroaches and giant millipedes. Um, in honesty, Matthew, if you know what you're doing as a guide, it's not a dangerous job to do. There will be many who will tell you otherwise. Uh, they will normally have their shirts rolled up to like sort of that length. They'll have their shorts wrapped up to sort of just below underpants level and they'll normally carry an enormous knife on their belts just to demonstrate how dangerous it is to be out here. Um, it is not particularly dangerous if you know what's going on and certainly coming on safari is not a dangerous activity at all uh, if you have a guide that knows what he's doing and most of the guides out here now there's a pretty good standard. So it's not dangerous to come on safari. It's a real adventure, though. It really is. To be in an environment like this that will make you feel uncomfortable because it is so unfamiliar. There are elephants all over the place. Well, normally. And there are buffalo all over the place. There are lions. There are leopards. There are rhino. There are all sorts of animals that are very unfamiliar to you. And so it does feel a little bit dangerous when you get here and you're unfamiliar with it. But it's actually, if you settle down and relax and just get into it, it is the most wonderful feeling that the wilderness like this will give to you. You'll feel a tremendous sense of connection with the earth. And to me, rather than the kind of um, suggested danger, if you like, for me, the connection with wilderness, with animals like this, and with a landscape like this, is the real essence of coming on a safari. So not dangerous at all, if you know what you're doing. And of course, that's just a tree. What is that, Fiam? Uh, that's just a tree that's been pushed over. It's the underside. Yeah, it's the underside. Gee whiz, that's the under... Do you know what that is, everyone? That, I mean, that is brilliant parking on my part, is what that is. Um, for goodness sakes. Right, that's as good as it gets. Um, that is the anopthorn tree, I think, that's been pushed over by an elephant. And it's got itself into the kind of thick, rocky layer that leads down into the drainage line here. And that has come right up and out of the ground. It's very brittle, especially when it's dry, and has come out of the ground and left this sort of white tower there. Very unusual. It was pushed over by an elephant, and we were talking about elephants, and a question about what the average size of elephant herds are from someone called Great Grand Telope. A marvelous name, Great Grand Telope. And you want to know the so average size of a herd of elephants in the Kruger? It's normally sort of between 8 and 15 individuals. Uh, normally not much bigger than that, but in the sort of high to the dry season, you will find much larger agglomerations of water. And quite often, we get sort of 20 or 30 at the water hole at the Juma Dam Pan, and then they all kind of greet and they finish, and they all come from different directions, and then they walk off in different directions. So you might see a big herd of 30, but it's more than likely that the actual makeup of that herd is probably only about 8 to 15. Gimpy, there's a little marsh terrapin in there.
the little baby one, the junior, very happy to have some water to be born into. There he is. Now, what I would really like is for that marsh terrapin to stick his head out of the water because in order to truly identify whether he is a marsh terrapin or a serrated hinged terrapin, we need to see whether he has got tentacles hanging from his lip. It does give them a rather otherworldly and unattractive look. And you combine that with the incredible stench that they're able to produce if you catch them. Yeah, they're not the... No, they're, they're not the most popular animals out here. Anyway, that is the marsh terrapin, and they live normally in puddles, as opposed to permanent water like the ones that we see at the Jumadam Pan, which are serrated hinged terrapins. And he will lie in wait there. And, well, he's a very little one, so he's going to eat largely insects and invertebrates. But when he gets a bit bigger, he will be attempting to catch birds as they come down to drink, like a little crocodile with a shell. Now, Gail and Rhode Island, you're a bit worried about the tail on the end of that elephant, and you want to know if that will affect his lifespan at all, given that it's obviously, you've seen elephants before using it as a parasite swatter or fly swatter. Gail, I don't think it'll make a huge difference, you know. I think that the tail, yes, it's a helpful, useful thing to have um, for an elephant, but their skins are so thick, I don't think it would make as much difference as it would on, say, a giraffe, or perhaps on a zebra. Or well, even they, you know, I mean, they've got ox peckers to eat, help them eat. It might, you know what, the chances are, I'd say no, very small chance, but maybe you will just be in more trouble than most elephants would, and therefore that might, maybe due to stress, take a year or two off his life, but I don't think it will make a huge difference to his life. It is quite interesting, that, and I mean, we've seen tailless lionesses in the Talala Pride, two, one, and then a daughter also lost the tail doesn't seem to have any effect on them at all. Of course, a lion's tail is normally used to, as a following mechanism rather than a fly swatter. But maybe so, maybe that's the reason. I don't see any leopards here on Hyena Road, do you, Bill? No. You will tell me, will you? Oh. Okay, thanks. Lots of little mud puddles, and just so nice that we have them now. And I hope they last a little bit longer and really good to just check in them because they obviously leave very obvious tracks. If something comes to have a quick drink at a puddle, you will notice its tracks very easily. in Chicago, you want to know if I've ever been charged by an animal. So on the subject of danger, have I ever been charged? Just before I answer that question, there's an, or an oriole calling. Can you hear it? What a beautiful liquid call. Yes, I have been charged by the odd elephant. I've been charged by the odd leopard. The odd lion has given me a warning. Um, I had a leopard on the bonnet once, which was fairly terrifying. But, and the odd elephant too has come bustling out of the bush. There was one particular elephant where I used to work and she had recurved tusks, so she was easy to, to identify and she would just hear a vehicle and come herring out of the bush at you. She wouldn't even bother to find out what she wanted. And, but that's so unusual, you know. Um, it is possible. And again, you can go on safari and you can hear guides telling all sorts of heroic stories about being charged by animals. Um, and it does happen every so often, but I think you need to divide a lot of those stories by 10. And I tend, I try not to dwell on those things, to be honest, because it's not the reason for being out here. James Richard, 
we're talking about the elephants and their ability to live a long life and you say does that make them especially uh, resistant to disease more than any other animal would be because they're long lived no james i don't think it does i don't think that that's that's relevant i think their their longevity is given borne out by their size now apparently i spoke to a heart surgeon once or a cardiologist and he said within reason within a certain kind of confidence interval you can tell how long an animal is going to live by the number of by its size and that's because the heart in all mammals has only got a finite number of beats it can give before it will eventually give out so where a mouse for example i'm just going to get through this and hopefully not squish any terrapins full of mud there um, where a mouse will have a heart rate of well over probably 200 beats per minute an elephant will have a heart rate of probably around 30 beats per minute uh, or, or maybe around what ours is so about 60 beats per minute if you're relatively fit and that predicates the, the length of the life which is quite interesting and I don't think that the ability to I mean all animals out here are very good at resisting parasites and very few animals out here will die of sickness unless they do, are nutritionally deficient so mostly they will die of being eaten by a predator very few will die of old age and the aging process normally happens faster the smaller the animal is very nice question that actually I haven't thought about that for a while Okay, let's head across to Scott to see what he's got to show you. Hello everyone, and we've been driving through the Marikini riverbed system hoping to find some sign of the Anderson male. We were told, sorry about that abrupt halt there, we were told that his tracks were very close to this area. This is called Broken Dam. I think on our right here used to be the dam wall. And interestingly, the first time we all saw Anderson Mail live, he walked up this road and disappeared off to the west where we could not follow him. He was initially lying down under this bush on our left-hand side over here. We got here, viewed him for about 30 seconds or a minute or so, and then he got up, started walking across to where I've just showed you where he moved up and out, up along that road there. This appears to be an area that he likes to move in quite a lot. Um, just the other day I came back here, I was telling you a similar story, and I jumped out and found his tracks coming through this very area. Interestingly going, not away, but in. So, we are just going to continue working this area. And hopefully going to get lucky. Oh, well, very happy to hear that a very important person is watching the show. His name is David Dyson, and he is my father. Hello, Dad, and I hope you're doing okay. You would like to know if, uh, well, you've mentioned that, you know, elephants have been known to charge vehicles, and would like to know if buffaloes have ever been recorded doing a similar thing. On foot, we know that that happens. It's dangerous to encounter buffalo on foot. But in the vehicle, is there anything to worry about? And yes, there is. Um, it's less uh, common than uh, elephants attacking vehicles, but it does happen from time to time. It's never happened to me, um, although once a buffalo did run into the front of my vehicle, but it was trying to escape from five big male lions called the Mapojo. So I didn't blame it for running into us. It was merely just trying to get out the way and I was parked in its escape routes. Thankfully though, it didn't, uh, it wasn't aiming to attack us. And as soon as it realized it was coming up against a solid structure, it knew that it needed to try and avoid us. So it just kind of tapped us and then continued along its way to avoid the lions jumping on its back. I've heard also a story from my friend Barnaby Gawi, a Kenyan guy, um, who my dad knows, but none of you guys will know. And once a buffalo up in Kenya was rammed into the back of their Land Rover, it had its eyeball staring into the back row of passengers. 
and its horn had gone through the roof. So it was temporarily kind of stuck to the vehicle and eventually did manage to uh, let itself free. So that's one confirmed story of a buffalo crashing into a car. Another one was on a property not too far south of us where the buffalo crashed into the side of the vehicle between where the tracker seat would be right on the end of the hood there and the dashboard basically and the track had jumped over the buffalo into the passenger seats and from the passenger seats I think springed right onto the back row of seats. So it does happen but not nearly as often as it does with elephants. Oh no, looks like, oh no the lapel mic's still working, I'm not sure it sounds like you guys are having trouble hearing me, don't know what that could be. It appears like all of our batteries are in place. Hello? Hello? Any better? Dad, very happy to have you on safari. Tell mom I say hello. And enjoy whatever she cooks you for dinner tonight. I'm sure it will be tasty. My mother's a very good cook. And I miss her food when I'm out here in the wilderness. Come on, Anderson Mail. Sadly, I've got absolutely zero comms with the final control room. All I can hear is <coughs> So if you guys do need to jump onto James's vehicle, I will not feel hurt if you guys do it whenever you please. So if you guys are raced away without me saying goodbye, there's, there's a good reason for it. We are as far west as we can possibly be in search of Anderson and that comes with a small sacrifice, well quite a large one because we cannot hear what the final control room is saying to us. Which will make it difficult for me to chat with you. I can hear a very crackly link to James sound coming through so over to James, we will see you later. Right, hello, <laughs> back again. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I was messing around, of course, naturally, always messing around, and I'm supposed to be coming live. Often involves an embarrassing situation. Right, we're driving through a very nice area. This is one of my favorite areas on this reserve. It's a lowland area leading into the Mulwati drainage line, or Mulwati River. I think we should call it the Mulwati River. And I like it because there are a whole lot of natural pans that occur here, where often we find buffalo and various other animals that like to wallow on a hot day. And the best thing about driving through here today is that these pans are now full of mud, which means that we could see things lying in them, like buffalo. And I'll give you an idea of what I mean here. Here's one of these pans. Oh dear, now I've lost my comms. Right, okay, I think I'm getting the uh, getting the question here. Now, a question from Sparkle. Apparently, Scott was talking about his mother's cooking, and you want to know, I have no idea about Scott's mother's cooking. I don't know if it's good or appalling. Um, but you, you want to know if we live with the same luxuries that you do, with the electronics and perhaps the biscuits and the, the, uh, the easy convenience foods, or do we live like the original inhabitants, inhabitants of the Earth, um, you know, drinking rainwater, collecting it, and growing our own food, and collecting seeds and roots. Um, Sparkle, I'd love to tell you it was the latter. I really would. But no, we eat probably a very similar diet to yours. Well, I don't know how, what kind of diet you have. But we, the town nearby has got a fairly large supermarket in it of suspect quality. And we get our food from there. You know, we order it once a week, it comes in. Uh, Viam certainly eats uh, a great deal of food that uh, our bodies certainly were never designed to eat. Hey, Viam. Yes, 
and it's almost, <laughs> it's all done by Sunday, he says. Uh, Viam lives on a diet of Milo and chicory, that's basically what he eats. But we don't obviously, within reason, Sparkle, we don't have convenience foods. We can't go across to a takeout joint or get a freshly made pizza or anything like that. So while the possibility to eat healthily exists, it's quite interesting because we live in a remote area, often stuff like fresh, pro fresh produce is quite difficult to get hold of. But that's basically what we eat. Some people have more luxury foods than others. We were laughing, of course, because of the way the question was framed in the final control, and I shall not share that with you. Leanne got herself very tongue-tied. My mother, however, is a, not a bad cook. My father is an excellent cook. I am an absolutely horrendous cook. Vim, are you a decent cook? Uh, I've never... No. Horrible. You're a horrible cook, are you? Is that why you live on a diet of chicory and milo? And two-minute noodles. And two-minute noodles. Delicious. I did once make a meal for everybody in camp. Well, twice, actually. Um, the second time round, I made a chicken stir-fry. The chicken stir-fry that I made tasted a little bit like, like that. I think it tasted like that leaf. Mmm. In fact, it was a very similar taste. Just kind of a fairly bland with an unpleasant aftertaste. There was a lot left over for breakfast and lunch the next day. It disappeared. Somebody, I think, I'm not mistaken, tossed it. I suspect Nicola Austin quite strongly. She's got a very sophisticated palate. As far as the cooking goes, that's how it is. understand your question entirely but I'm going to try it you want to say do we pay in rands at Juma uh, yes you would have to pay in rands if you came to Juma unless they have an overseas banking account which I'm not sure is uh, if they do or not I don't think so and you want to know about how wh what does it mean when you pay 11 or 12 rand well what it means is that your dollar at the moment is worth around 16 rand so the exchange rate means that for one dollar that you spend here, you'll get 16 rand. Now that doesn't equate to your being able to eat at a tremendously cheaper rate, although I think you will find the cost of living is slightly cheaper than where you live. So I don't know what it's but South Africa at the moment is actually quite an expensive place to live. But because of the... Mm, the uh, um, so because of the exchange rate, it will mean that you'll probably get quite a lot more bank work, $16 to the dollar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. this everybody we're in a slightly dodgy signal area but i just did hear a franklin going finish line and see if we can't see something mm. got anything in there vmp mm -mm. nothing sneaking down the drainage line nah. it's fairly in keeping with current form uh, just turn off quickly and see if we can't hear something else alarm calling. I don't hear any further alarm calls. I think maybe those Franklins were just having a personal spat. Anyway, 
all the way from Cedar Falls. Lots of bang for your buck if you come out here. 16 Rand to one pound, well worth your while. Definitely cheaper than, for example, a European holiday. But you will have to pay rands, but you can just do that on your credit card. Very simple. The days of traveler's checks and all those sorts of things are long gone. who this question comes from. I think it's Vern again. Vern, you want to know about what happens with lions when they come into camp? You say, well, you know, on the subject of living in the bush, what happens when four lions wander into camp and go flat cat in the middle of the day and aren't guests at risk? The first thing to know about that, Vern, is that it does happen every so often. Not so much where we live because of the arrangement of the camp. But certainly I've seen it happen in Botswana many times, and I know there's a wilderness safaris camp there that's got uh, decking. You know, all the rooms and tents are joined by decking, and that decking, once people woke up one morning and found a whole pride of lions sort of draped about the place. These hornbills, look at these little hornbills so close by. Look at them. I bet those are young yellow-billed hornbills, and I bet you'll find they were born just in that tree over there. Oh, there's a red build on the right and a yellow build on the left. Do you know how I can tell the difference? Fiam? Um, color of the bill? Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yes, they've got different colored bills. <laughs> anyway, we're on the subject of lions in camp. And it does happen from time to time, but it's not common, and the reason it's not common is that because normally in a camp there's a tremendous amount of noise. So, you know, there's a workshop going, there are people talking all the time, there are, I don't know, there are kitchen noises, there's odd smells coming out of the camp. And so you find that lions and most animals will avoid the vicinity of a camp unless it's under cover of darkness when they feel just a bit more comfortable and a bit more hidden. And so that's why you can get away with having people walking around during the middle of the day in an unfenced camp. As long as they're careful, we do give them a safety briefing and just, you know, inform them what to do if they do see an animal. But after dark, people are not allowed to walk around on their own inside a camp because that's when the predators will move through. They feel a lot more com confident about moving through in the night time. Very nice question. Thank you, Vern. Are there any roads we haven't driven this afternoon? Not many. Mm. Gail in Calgary. <laughs> I'm laughing because it, this is not the same question, Gail, but it's a similar one. I'll get on to that story once I've answered your question. You want to know what about local fruits? What fruits will you be? You're coming fairly soon and you want to know what fruits you'll be able to get. Well, it depends where you stay, but I mean, most of the lodges around here are most salubrious uh, accommodations, which means that you'll be able to get just about anything you can think of. Uh, most of them will serve any fruit you can imagine or in you know anything anything you can get at home you'll be able to get at the lodge here especially if you tell them beforehand they will be able to get it uh, it's really not that difficult out here most of the stuff is grown out here and if it isn't then it's normally imported and that's because we have people with very kind of um shall we say european or american tastes coming through all the time and so these lodges are geared up to cater for that you won't be eating local fruits because well i mean local fruits consist of quarry berries marulas and sour plums and they're just not particularly nice with your morning muesli so you will be eating a diet very similar to the one that you have at home and i remember once a guest saying to me in fact she's quite a famous she i think she became quite famous some of you may have heard of her in the United States called Jana Stansfield. And she's a singer and she does sort of motivational talking. And she was just getting going in her career when I met her. And she, her friend, I remember her telling me that her friend asked her before she moved out here 
for her holiday, they said, but what on earth are you going to eat in Africa? And the answer is well, the same thing that you eat at home. Well, less McDonald's and less Burger King, of course, but very nice diet, very good food, brilliant chefs out here, so you'll eat very, very well, Gail. Fear not. Well, my next port of call is going to be to drive the length of Ingwe Alley, hoping that it lives up to its name of being an alley full of Ingwe's. In other words, an alley full of leopards. Whether that will be the case or not is anyone's guess. Well, on current form, <laughs> have a little listen here. I heard a bird alarm calling. There it is, Vim. It is the southern black tit, which I think many of you will have on your bird list already. But if you don't, he's an indicator of a bird party. So if you are a birder or an ornithologist, and you like to see different kinds of birds. If you see him, it's well worth your while stopping because he's often an indicator that there's a feeding party going on of insect-eating birds that will be flying through with him. I don't know why he's always with so many other birds, except today, of course, but normally lots of other birds with him. Crombecks, waxbills sometimes, sometimes sunbirds, often yeah, 10 or 12 different species. That is the southern black tit. We're going to now basically draw a line, or we're going, to, we're going to draw a line, we're going to drive a line parallel with this depression here, this dry stream bed, and see if we can't pick up some tracks there. There's a Franklin calling, not alarming, just territorially calling. I think the weather is due to clear up tomorrow, and I think it will be very interesting to see the change in the animal makeup as tomorrow comes along, or when the sun does eventually come out. I'm not going to hope too soon that it comes out, simply because it has been so hot, but I think it's going to be amazing to see the emergence of beautiful insects. Now, Deb, an interesting, very, very good question. Deb, you say, what would stop different subspecies of hornbills or oxpeckers, red-billed and yellow-billed, from interbreeding? Why wouldn't they interbreed? Um, Deb, the simple answer is that they're not subspecies. They are different species entirely. So although they look very similar, and the apparent only difference is their different bill color, they are not the same species, and therefore, they don't breed with each other. I wouldn't surprise me if there'd been an attempt or two. And just quickly here, Vim, if you don't mind, that's the sausage tree. And we had a question about the sausage tree. Somebody wanted to see it yesterday. I forget exactly who. But that is the sausage tree. And the sausage tree, you can see, has got no sausages on it, has it, Vim? Mm -mm. It is sausage-free. The enormous pods that grow off the sausage tree, not this year, and no flowers either. But that is the only example of the sausage tree that I know of from this reserve, and pointed out to me, not by anybody who actually lives here, but pointed out by someone in Finland and someone else in Texas. A deeply embarrassing moment in my life. On that note, let's head across to Scott, see what he's got for you. Welcome back. Camp life and cooking. Well, I can assure you we do eat very well. I'm sure James has just said that. It's the best I've ever eaten at any camp wherever I've worked. Um, so, 10 points for Safari Live there. And we are certainly very lucky with our crew and just about everything. Accommodations, not the best, but the food makes up for it. And for me, accommodation is just a place to sleep. At the end of the day, we've got this wonderful playground to explore, which I do for the hours that I'm awake. And I am only ever really in my room when it's time to sleep. So you would uh, like to know who the best cook is in the camp. 
That's Dylan in Iowa, as I'm sure a lot of you as well. Well, we're very fortunate. We have got uh, uh, cooks that, that uh, cook for us. Since I've been with Safari Live, we've had three different uh, cooks, uh, two of which are still currently employed. Um, the first one was probably the best. Sadly, he uh, went back home to Zambia, and he was incredible, Emmanuel. What have you spotted up there? Oh, well done, Dave. Let me, oh, there it goes, a big white back vulture. Just as well, Dave's concentrating. You would have seen a glimpse of its white back there just before it disappeared behind the tree line. And probably there as well, wonderful. Um, now we've got Tanda Killer and Salty Frank. He's called Salty Frank because he uses a lot of salt. Funny that. But we've, we've <laughs> slowly but surely got him to put less salt in our food um, so that it's more tasty. He's got a very good uh, way with spices. It's just the salt that is a bit overpowering. So the Salty Frank and Tanda Killer at the moment doing a good job for us cooking our, our meals on a daily basis. Every second day we have a fry up and every other day we'll have uh, fresh muffins, ba freshly baked muffins, muesli and fruits. So breakfasts are good, lunch it's a lottery, dinner, uh, barbecues, just all the regular kind of dinners. But then there are specialities that certain crew members will perform on behalf of the crew, like little treats. James is the Don Pedro professional. He makes us uh, whiskey flavored milkshakes most Friday nights. It's a Friday tradition, the Don Pedro nights, and that's James's kind of main, main thing. But he's got a helper in the form of Kirsty McLennan Smith. And they've even branched out from milkshakes into cheesecakes. They made the most delicious strawberry cheesecake the planet has ever seen just the other day. And due to their great success, they got quite bold and ambitious and tried to make a coffee cheesecake next, their second cheesecake ever, uh, which was a great failure. And James ended up putting it all through a blender and it went from being in a round dish to into like a bread tin. He tried to like completely resurrect it. It's due to the fact that something in their mixture caused curdling, which uh, made James and Kirsty panic. So we had a taste of it. It wasn't too bad, but it never really got, I don't know what, end, what, what ended up happening to it. Then what are the other specialities that people do? Um, uh, Brent's uh, garlic chops or chops garlic, depending on, uh, I guess ratio-wise it's more garlic than chops. He basically quarters a clove or an individual segment of, of garlic uh, times 50 million and then soaks the chops in the most garlicky sauce you've ever seen and then applies that onto the barbecue. A lot of the garlic does fall off, but that's Brent's very garlicky chops. A hit amongst the staff. I uh, initiated a, a beer up the chicken's rear end device. Um, it's actually worth, I need to try and, I've got a picture on my phone somewhere, I need to find it for you. It's this device that basically holds four beer cans vertically and that device fits into a 44 gallon drum which is those massive big drums that fuel and other things get transported but it's like the biggest metal drum that you or I, your average person would have seen or known about and that's cut in half horizontally and that's turned it so it's a, a big lid um, ginormous braai or barbecue and the beer holding up four vertical beers contraption that four chickens will sit on vertically so that the beer foams through while you cook. Oh, my mouth is beginning to water. It is so tendy and smoky and juicy and delicious. It's been a while since we've actually done that, so we need to get Salty Frank on it. Um, so that was my contribution to the kitchen. Oh, Nikki's broccoli salad. Uh, this is almost worth uh, tweeting the recipe. It is incredibly, incredibly good. Um, 
It's basically raw broccoli, grated cheese, some apple cider vinegar, I think, mixed with mayonnaise to create like a bit of a dressing. Uh, mixed with a little bit of sugar, so it's like a sweet dressing, sesame seeds and raisins, and bacon if you like, crispy bacon. Delicious raw broccoli salad, that's Nikki's contribution. Uh, James calls it dessert salad. That's because Tandakilia, the other chef's got quite a, a, a heavy hand with the sugar. So maybe we should call her Sweet Tandy and Salty Frank because she puts a lot of brown sugar into that apple cider mayo mix. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's why James calls it dessert salad. <laughs> but really tasty. What else happens? Hmm. Teresa Williams. Um, let, me, let me put you out of your misery, Teresa. You've been wondering if Brent has learned how to wash the dishes yet. Stop thinking along that uh, thought process. Cancel that thought entirely and just uh, understand that Brent will not wash the dishes ever, period. <laughs> That's the end of that. <laughs> so that's, there's other things, you know, that on this planet that we live on, everyone has certain things that they are good at, uh, you know, and, and then there are also the weaknesses that every single human possesses. And the cleaning of dishes is Brent's weakness. That is his problem. So I hope we can put you out of your misery there. Um, yeah, if you guys are missing Brent and wondering when he'll be back, I think it'll be around the 8th of March. Jamie, I think, gets back on the 4th, so they're both enjoying a leave. They could be taking a long walk down an empty beach now, for all we know. Okay, sounds like James has possibly found you an egg. I hope he doesn't plan on cooking it for you. Anyway, why don't you go and see? Can you see what I'm doing? Hello, everybody. I was originally trying to get to show you an egg here, but I've got a dwarf burrowing scorpion and I'm fishing for it. He's in this hole here. And I'm just gonna try and pull him out. He's holding on. I think he's going to let go. So this is the burrowing scorpion, Opisticanthus. I can, oh, I can see him. This, this is not an Opisticanthus. Did you see him there, Vim? No. You can't see him. He's behind this. Tough of grass. Tough of grass. Anyway, he's in there, but his burrow is that deep. It's almost a foot deep. So he's at the back end of a foot long tunnel. That's what he lives in. He's about that big and he's called, or otherwise called a brown burrowing scorpion. That's not why I got out here though. Here we have an egg. And this egg is not in a nest. I don't know how it got here. Maybe it was kicked out of a Franklin's nest. I think it's a Franklin's egg. But maybe it was kicked out of a nest somewhere close by, and here it has been abandoned. Um, it's definitely still got something in it. I can. Well, I can't, I can't hear anything, but it's quite heavy. There's definitely something in it. We're going to leave it where we found it. I mean, I was initially thinking about trying to dissect it, but I don't know if the parents will come back. I seriously doubt it. It's definitely not in a nest at the moment, so I think it's probably going to be eaten by an egg-eating snake, perhaps, or something of that nature. Shall we continue, Viam? We have found no leopards on Leopard Alley at the moment. So just to give you an idea, that burrowing scorpion at a burrow that length, which I think is pretty impressive. Don't you? On we go. I'm very glad that Scott gave a description of the uh, cooking skills of the camp and that he made mention of Brent's inability to wash any kind of dish. I think that's very important. <laughs> Brent is actually a very good cook, though, when he takes the time. To, uh, to cook. On we go. <laughs> I wonder how that Franklin egg got there. We haven't thought maybe in the rain it got washed away. Possible. I suspect what happened though that it was got kicked out of a nest maybe by a 
I don't know, some buffalo walking through here or even some water walking through here. A mongoose might also eat an egg, of course, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you can probably find some footage of it. A mongoose will eat an egg by lining a rock up behind it and then standing and flinging the egg through its legs so that it cracks on the, on the rock behind and then it will eat whatever comes out of the egg. Quite a clever way of eating eggs if you're a little mongoose. Now, Crystal, you're wondering how soon after a leopardess has lost her cubs she might come back into estrus. Uh, Crystal, I think you'll find that if she loses her cubs, she would come into estrus. Just with the hope that perhaps Karula still has her youngsters. We don't know. I think indications are that maybe that isn't the case. But the fact that we haven't seen her around tells me that she's hiding somewhere. And I don't think she would be hiding if she was an estrus, and I think she would have uh, probably come into estrus by now if she had lost those cubs. But we'll see, I don't know. We might be very pleasantly surprised one day. Whatever the case, if we are not seeing her and she still has her cubs, uh, that's not a bad thing. It's entirely a good thing that she's in complete privacy at the moment. Shadow, I also have got no idea where Shadow is or what she's doing. And I suspect, I mean, I suspect very strongly, in fact, that uh, she's doing much the same as I hope Karuna's doing. Of course, we aren't seeing their tracks at the moment because the road is very hard. But I mean, we haven't seen their tracks now since before these rains that we had over the last few days. So I don't think that that's why we're not seeing the tracks. There is an impala there. <laughs> Shall we move on? Cameron, you're just six, and you want to know about how leopards sleep. They sleep like lions with their feet up in the air. Sometimes they do, Cameron, especially if they're little. But they don't sleep in the same way that lions sleep. Remember, lions are very, very big, and so they are never scared of anything coming to get them, whereas a leopard is quite small, like a big dog, and so they need to be careful of things coming to get them, or things that might pose them danger, like lions or even hyenas. And so that means that when they sleep, they sleep for a little bit, and then they lift up their heads and they look around, and then they sleep a bit more. Same with the cheetah. The cheetah lies sideways and has got a special neck that allows it to stick its head up and look. Well, it would be very uncomfortable for you and I, but it can sit up and look like that while it's sleeping and then put its head back down again. So only the lions are able to sleep the way they do because they're so big and everything else is very scared of them. Otherwise, it would be impossible. Thank you, Cameron. Very nice question. Very astute question for a six-year-old. There's a lilac, lilac breast rose. Let us look at them in the absence of uh, large predatory mammals. There's also an ant nest or gall next to it. I don't know what that is. The swellings in the trees are something of a mystery to me. I think that where they've the tree has actually been stung by some kind of insect and it creates this kind of tumor or growth. Now, while we're looking at that bird, I've just been reading about, I've been reading a couple of bird books of late, and this one is interesting. You see the way the bird is perching there. Now, it just looks like the bird is sitting like you and I would sit on a tree, or well, not on a tree at all, well, like, like you and I would sit on a chair or stand on the ground. The complications of doing what that bird is doing there are amazing, simply because the branch is moving all the time, and especially if they're sitting on a much sort of thinner branch, it's constantly moving. Now, what that means is that the bird is constantly trying to balance and overbalance and underbalance and maintain its balance. 
and they do it with such incredible skill. The neurological system in a bird that allows it to be able to do that and the muscles that have to adjust so slightly all the time to make them balance like that are quite astonishing. It's nothing like when you and I are sitting. It's like a constant sitting, standing on a tightrope, basically, for a bird. You're on Twitter, and a very nice question given we, that we saw that abandoned egg, and you're saying of the ground nesting birds uh, breeding less now that we don't have um, well, because of the drought. And the answer, Gerda, is yes, absolutely. They definitely would be breeding less. The chicks will survive less. The eggs will probably not hatch as much, and that's because the parents don't have the right nutrition. They don't have the seeds to eat. In the case of a Franklin, they will also eat lots of insects, of course, or Franklins, but there aren't as many insects around. So yes, absolutely, they will be affected. No question. But hopefully, the flush of green that has come up here is going to help. Now, Scott has got some more beefaloes to show you. Let's go and see them. So we've come back to the waterhole, which is called Red Dam, here on Arethusa. This is where we saw the buffalo pranking around earlier. It was interestingly enough that one up there, I'm pretty confident that we saw jumping and jiving. The one on the ground here is a newcomer, but not the one that we saw approaching the, the pond earlier or after we were leaving. I can tell that because it's only got its right horn, its left horn is broken off. Other oh, chaps just a bit to the left, I think, there, Dave. There, he's disappeared behind those bushes. But that was the guy that was bucking and bronking. We are waiting here patiently in the hope that soon the vehicles will stop viewing Tangana, or at least another space will uh, arise for us, but it's been a fairly constant flow of traffic, so Tangana's been paying his dues this afternoon, making a lot of tourists very, very happy that they get to see a leopard during their safari. Interestingly, uh, in my time guiding here in the Sabi Sands, I mean, I wasn't in this area, but the whole of the Sabi Sands is generally much of a muchness regarding the game viewing. It just depends on the luck of your specific three days there or four days there, which is the average day. But almost every single set of guests that I had, and that most guides in the Sabi Sands have, for three or four nights, that's the average day, like I say, almost every single one of them will leave having seen the Big Five. And that is a remarkably uh, good statistic. Uh, for guests or for any tour operator to say, go there, your chances of seeing the big five are just about 100%. Not quite, of course, there's always that chance you may not, but that is why this area is so popular and one of certainly the best game viewing destinations that I've ever worked in for the big five. Hello, Christine in North Carolina. Thanks, Seeps. Um, sorry, Seeps, uh, a fellow guide who I used to work with uh, nearby, well, not nearby, I was nearby, he was in the Kruger, but working for the same lodge company as me, he just drove past saying something that he's going to chase the lions towards us, something along those lines, so let's hope he does. Um, I've completely forgot who was asking me what, but somebody was asking me something a little bit earlier. Christine in North Carolina. Um, so now I've got your name, but I don't have a clue what you were wanting to know. So I'll just wait for Leanne, who's directing the show. Oh, sorry, Christine. Have I ever seen anything in the bush that I simply cannot explain? Something that has really baffled me that hasn't made sense. Christine? I can't uh, think of anything that comes to mind that stands out. I mean, a lot of things that happen uh, out here we don't know and we can't explain, but nothing really 
that has stumped me or been like, this doesn't make sense. Just some things we merely don't understand because we're not one of the animals. It's not that it doesn't make sense. Um, I've just been reminded me of one interesting sighting, uh, one that you know I had never seen and, and most guides would, would never see in a whole career, is a Woodlands Kingfisher. It was a, it was a juvenile, we could tell because of its beak coloration that it was young. It was flying into the Buffalo waterhole and landing there with its wings out and almost just like f well, just floating, with, but with its body submerged. So, well, let's take a look at this buffalo. I think, I think we might get a little bit more bracking bronco action. So, yeah, I'm not too sure, other than that, what's happened that's kind of been inexplicable and undescribable. So apologies, Christine. I think James might be the person to answer a question like that. My filing cabinets came up with a blank there. There you can see that buffalo is missing his left horn, as I said earlier, which will what made me confirm that he was an, in fact, the individual we saw approaching the waterhole. Good. Well, it sounds like we are now capable of making our way towards Tangana. So let's let's do just that. I think there's enough space freed up there now. Interestingly, and just to keep you guys updated, is that The vehicle, the, vehicle, the vehicle standby scenario for the sighting was actually kept to two vehicles, not the regular three vehicles. So even though typically the sighting will be for three vehicles, this sighting was kept to a, minimum, a maximum of two, simply because it was a bit tight, there would have been too much pressure on Tingana. So a good example of how the guides in this area will just use their own discretion to, to kind of decide how a sighting should be handled. And I think it's great that they did say that. I initially said, try and get three vehicles in here, but I was maybe being a little bit optimistic, being used to our little short wheel based vehicle that we can wiggle in and out of. You forget that the other game viewers are like limousines, they're huge and long. But that's also a reason why there's still this kind of flow of people making their way through that sighting. So imagine now for those guys who've had to plan their drive knowing that they are seventh in queue and need to spend there for an hour and a half doing something else before getting into the right area. Complicated. Making the right decisions out here. And something that I guess we at Safari Live don't really have to do to the extent or degree that the other guides do. Hello, Maurice, on Twitter. Hello, guys. Hello, Peter. How are you doing? Sorry, Maurice. I'll get back to you now. Um, How's everything? Okay. Very good. Good to see you again. You too, Pete. Yeah. You too. How are things? All good? Yeah. Good, man. How's it, everyone? Good? Yeah. Very good. Okay, enjoy your beer or your wine or your gin. Hey, very nice. See you later. Bye. So there you go. They've just left Tangana, the big male leopard that we're heading off to now. And we are going to leave them be as they head off for their gin and tonics. Uh, apologies, Maurice. You would like to know if the animals in the Kruger Park are more unpredictable due to the fact that there's a lot of self-drive people there driving themselves through the Kruger. So anybody in the world can fly to South Africa, rent a car and drive themselves through the Kruger with zero experience of the wilderness area or how to behave. And that I think is, is great in many regards, but the negative is, is that animals may be exposed to clowns. I think clowns is the best word that I can use to describe these sorts of people. And in, in, in fairness, some of them are clowns and others are, you know, you cannot blame them. They've been born into clown society and have never been educated otherwise, I guess. Um, but because of this, it does mean that animals are not as 
uh, or certain animals that may not be as relaxed with the vehicles or not be as predictable as the animals in the Saabi sands. Um, then there's the, also the kind of the flip side of the equation and that is that simply because there's not as many roads, the road density in the Kruger National Park is not nearly as much as the Saabi sands. You've got some blocks of vegetation that are 60,000 hectares or even larger. Now that is the size of our entire reserve, the Sabi Sands, which has got about a 20, I've just heard wild dogs being called in over the radio, but not in our area, but they at least in the general area. So maybe tomorrow we'll get lucky, that's Sibambili Lodge. Um, So I'm just gonna get into position here, which is gonna take a while because there's a few other vehicles making their way here still. So I just wanna get us into a position where we can snipe a long distance view of them. So as I was saying, um, the road network in the Kruger is not nearly as dense as the Saabi Sands. We've probably got thousands of miles of road network in 60,000 hectares of property. Whereas, like I said, there's parts of Kruger that will have 60,000 hectares, not a road going through it. And what that means is that the animals don't get exposed to vehicles. And if they don't get exposed to vehicles, they don't know what ex to expect when they see them, and that's why they're frightened of them. So it's a combination um, of people possibly not behaving well, but to be honest, um, that is going to be play a very small impact on the way animals behave or are unpredictable. The, the bigger reason for that is simply that animals, a lot of the animals, are not getting exposed to people as much as they are here in the Sabi Sands. So it's a combination of the two. Cool, let's take a look at Tingana. He's moved ever so slightly further down this little, little water runoff area. And again, apologies for not the best view here, but I am preempting that other vehicles are making their way here. So I'm not sure who's just asked this, but one of you is interested to know how Juma works relative to the Kruger, relative to other... What have you heard? Have you heard something? Maybe another leopard calling? Sorry, it was you, Leanne in Texas, wanting to know about fenced reserves as opposed to non-fenced reserves like we are in here. Sorry, Diane, not Leanne. And Diane, yes, the Juma Reserve that we are a part of and the Saabi Sands and the Kruger National Park are all interlinked. There is a ginormous fence around the entirety of the Greater Kruger National Park, but we are within that fence. So the Saabi Sands basically has a small little patch of fencing that has been dropped. It was dropped in the early 90s. We used to be fenced in but now we are open to the Kruger, allowing animals to pass through this relatively small opening into the Sabi Sands, but there is free flow. If animals want to come here from the Kruger, they can and vice versa. The reserve then spreads north into Mozambique and Zimbabwe, right at the northern stretches. So it's a transfrontier national park. And because it is so large, over 3 million hectares, it means that the animals require very little managements, their populations take care of themselves because they are basically in an ecosystem that is big enough to allow mother nature to take care of things. In smaller parks, which do occur in South Africa, Diane, there are numerous smaller parks, with the big five on them, they need much closer managements, culling of certain animals if their populations become too high, or possibly capturing them and moving them elsewhere or bringing in new genes to ensure that there's enough diversity with the various animals. Contraceptives are used on certain animals. So yes, there's a lot more management in the smaller reserves and there are, are a large number of small reserves in Africa.
especially South Africa. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? It's a good thing. I would rather have natural areas where wild animals need to be managed than not have those wild areas at all. And it's a great benefit that, yes, we are part of this massive ecosystem, but that can naturally take care of itself, but that's not everywhere, not everywhere can be like that. So Louis just arrived, he's gonna get comfortable into a good spot. No, it's looking like he is going to get up pretty soon, so that's something to look forward to. For those of you who have just joined the safari, he's been here since we basically started at about four o'clock. So let's hope that we are lucky enough to follow him wherever he decides to go. I don't know why, from the moment we arrived here, I had this feeling that he's going to head on to Juma, so in an easterly direction, which would suit us. If he heads back into Arethusa from here, or at least directly west, he's going to go through a very, very thick area, making it difficult for us to follow him. Either way, we can expect to see quite a few big yawns. So be ready to take some screenshots. And ordinarily, I think, had he have not been so full-bellied, I think he would have already got up and moving by now. How's it in four? Good. Hello, Louis and friends. How are you doing? Good. Apologies, everyone. I was just saying hello to Louis and his two guests and his tracker. So now that he's got his head up, you can see the spots that I was speaking about earlier. He has got the whisker lines that you can see, those kind of black interconnected dots that the whiskers grow out of, and just above that, you can see two freckles that are joined together. This is on the right side of his nose. And then two individual freckles closer to his nostril. So that would be three spots, I guess, because the two are interconnected, plus the other two individuals. He's got three on the right-hand side, and I'm not sure exactly what he's got on the left. I always forget the spot patterns, so, but that is one way of distinguishing him. I think it's that he's got a 3-4, if I remember correctly, but if he does turn his head a little bit, we should notice that. Here we go. No, yeah, that could be four on the left, but again, it looks like the two furthest ones are interconnected, so it depends on the individual's preferences, I guess. Dave, I don't know if you need to pop another ND there, or you can. So Dave's just tweaked the camera a little bit to let in a bit more light as it's getting darker, which is just going to help him to get focus on this boy. Valerie on Twitter, you would like to know a little bit more about how the guides have to deal with all these standbys and the different protocols with sightings. And basically, how it works is that, oh, somebody's just going to squeeze past quickly. And then it looks like a new guide. So he's getting taken around by one of the more experienced guys and getting taught what to do. Anyway, it looks like he's got into a perfect spot there. I'm just going to give them a thumbs up so that they all know that everyone's happy, which is all good. So there we go. And now we can continue looking at the leopard. Um, sorry, Valerie, you were wondering how long will guides be able to stay in a sighting before having to move off? And the general rule is that 
they'll be here for about 20 minutes. Of course, it depends on a lot of things, how many vehicles are waiting by, or standing by, rather. But yes, your screenshots. I hope you guys got that. That was what we were waiting for, and he's probably going to continue to yawn a little bit more before he does get up a few more times. That's a usual trait of theirs. So, Valerie, um, before he rudely interrupted with that magnificent yawn, um, I was just going to finish up and say, yeah, on average, it's 20 minutes per sighting. But, of course, if you're the guy that found the animal, then you kind of, depending on how much time you invested in finding it, then maybe you can claim rights to the sighting. Um, at the end of the day, I guess you just have to remember that you can be on the receiving end of long standby queues, and that's why it kind of self-polices itself. Although in every team you have, or every area you work in, you've got guys that are known as the responders, and then the guys that do the tracking and find their own animals. So that is just the reality, I guess, in all walks of life, that's the same. Cheers, Louis. Hello, Leo in Atlanta. You would like to know if le leopards can purr, and if so, when? Well, Leo, I've never heard a leopard purring. I've heard them growling. I've heard them letting out their la loud, rasping vocalization. And I don't think they actually have the ability to purr. That's not simply because I haven't heard them purr, but it's because they've got a very special part of their voice box, which is a piece of cartilage which has become very hard. So normally in most cats it would be soft, but in these cats it's hard, and this is what allows them to make their loud noises, both the leopard and the lion. So I think it's just the house cats or smaller cats that can purr. The noise that the leopard makes, we're a bit too close, so I'm not going to try and make it now, but it sound of, kind of sounds like a saw, a wood saw, cutting through wood. I'll just try and do it softly. It's kind of what the leopard's general call sounds like. Hello, Lisa W. You'd like to know if I think that Tingana had any idea that Anderson male was lurking along the western portions of Arethusa. No, I don't. I think it's too far away. Um, possibly, if Anderson was vocalizing, um, Tingana would be able to hear the vocalization from here. I'm guessing he would. But no, I don't think that Tingana necessarily knows. There's, there's no reasons why he would. We, we're quite, quite far away. Probably two miles as the crow flies. We'd probably find he'd be looking in that direction, which is the opposite direction he's looking in now, if he did know something was happening over there. Hello, Marjorie. I think your granddaughter is watching with you. Why don't you let us know her name? That would be wonderful. And she would like to know um, whether or not this leopard is pregnant or hungry and how old it is. It's not pregnant. It's a big, 
big male and he is full of food. We're not sure what he's been feeding on. Uh, we've just found him here lying in exactly the same spot earlier this afternoon. So we don't know anything about what he's been feeding on. But we do know how old he is. He's nine. I'm not too sure when he's turning ten, but he's nine years old, which for a leopard is, is quite old. He's uh, a, 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 big, a big male, a big daddy. He's got probably lots of children by now. Uh, and he's maybe going to be around for another four or five years before he starts disappearing. Ooh, he's heard something in the bush here. What could it be? Well, we might get lucky and see him making a kill. There's something moving nearby, and the bush is quite thick here, so good cover. The wind is swirling, so I'm not too sure what exactly is happening with the wind. Well, uh, somebody seems to think that flash photography is not allowed here in the Sabi Sands. It is. I'm not sure who told you that. You weren't allowed flash photography. That was maybe in the certain reserve where you were on holiday. But here it is fine, uh, provided it's a, an adult uh, you know, animal that we know is comfortable with being uh, flashed with photography. Again, uh, a lot of you may be like, oh, shame, the poor leopard. Um, it doesn't want to be, have photos taken of it all day. But if these animals aren't seen and if people don't come here and understand why they need to be protected and essentially pay for this area to be protected, there'll be no funding to look after them. And everything in this world requires money. So a few flashes are, for me, not a problem at all. What have you heard there, Tangana? What's going on? I don't want to move the vehicle now. Um, I'll just keep still. That's the best thing to do if you are in and around a potential kill. That way you'll have the least impact by just staying put. Got any more stops there, Dave? Okay. So it's just tweaking the the settings on the camera to try and make things light. So I'm not going to use any artificial lights on him now, because that would permanently illuminate him and obviously make it easier for whatever may be moving through this area to see him. So we may just have to sit here in the dark as it gets darker. Hello, Karen. And you say that he's got a 5-5 five, five spot pattern. Now, again, it, I guess it's up to the individual who decides on these things, but I don't see how it's possible that he's got a 5-5 five, five spot pattern. Unless, of course, you split the two dots that are connected. So if you make those two individual, then that would make it 4-4 four, four in my mind. Um, but again, that's what makes... That's interesting. You see, for me, he's definitely got one small one by his nostril, then a slightly bigger one behind it, and then two that are interconnected behind that. And that's where the spots, in my mind, end on his left side. So I guess maybe I'm just not seeing in the slow lights, or whoever decided upon that can see some extra spots where I don't know. Yeah. Hello, Anna. You would like to know how we distinguish a male and a female leopard from a distance. Um, it's not easy, Anna. Um, and for me, the best way is to look underneath their tail. If there are a pair of testicles under the tail, then you can see them. If not, then, well, then it's a female. Um, but size is also a good general rule. Um, Males are considerably larger and bulkier than the females, so you can look at their physique. 
but from a distance it can be difficult. And uh, oh, another nice big yawn. Look at those canines in perfect condition. Now on his left side, let's look again. Two spots interconnected and another two. Maybe there's a third one above that middle one. Yeah, there is a little third one above the middle one there, I think. So, I guess they are using those two spots on this side that are interconnected as individuals. One, two, and then three that make a little triangle closer to his nostril. So we can understand, I can understand where Panthera, who is apparently officially named him having a 5-5 five, five spot pattern, I can see where they make the five on the right by splitting those two on the far left. But on the other side of his muzzle, on his left-hand muzzle, I couldn't in this light work that out. So anyway, maybe there is a, just a tiny little dot there that they're using. Hello, Jack, in Romania. You would like to know which of the African big cats have the either highest or lowest success rates in raising cubs. Jack, I don't have the faintest idea, but what I will be able to assure you is that it will fluctuate hugely depending on the specific area that any given big cat is being researched. You get areas where leopards occur where there are no lion and hyena, so therefore they've got a lot less threats from other species. They will, yes, still have threats from their own species. Male leopards that did not father certain offspring will kill them in order to be able to mate with that female. So that will happen. But, you know, obviously they're going to be losing a lot less of their young to animals like hyena and lion. So that's why it will all depend on the specific area of operation. And I think it's probably fairly matched between the lion and the, the leopard. The cheetah probably also lose a lot, but again, it just depends on the density of other predators in that area. Hello, Linton in India. You would like to know why none of these big cats attack us. Linson, that's because uh, people have been coming here for many, many years, since the 1960s, armed only with a camera. They're going to reverse now, Dave, so you can just zoom out. Um, this vehicle is just going to make their way out of here, so we're just going to zoom out so you don't get a blur of vehicle heading past you. Um, because people have been driving around here for so long, treating these animals with the uh, uh, correct respect and space and care, uh, the animals have come oblivious to us. Before that, however, Linton, the animals would have been terrified and they would have run away from vehicles every time that they came into contact with us and run away from humans. They would have been scared of us. And the reason why animals, as a general rule, are scared of us is because us as humans have persecuted them, hunted them for their coats, for food, just for any manner of reasons. But we did have a lot of negative impacts with these animals many years ago. So they've become inherently scared of us. And after many, many years of ensuring and kind of uh, what's the word? Cheers, guys. Um, by continuing to just try and really make them understand that we're not here to harm them, they have eventually got used to us. And this is the result. We can view animals at a close distance as if we're not even here. Thankfully, Linson, they do not see us as food because it would be very easy for them to eat us. Now, I know the light is fading, but because there is some possible prey nearby, I do not want to illuminate him. And that is, that is just one of those things. Which is perfect, actually, because you guys are going to go across to James for a quick update, and we'll be waiting here. Hopefully, we'll have some news for you when you come back. Oh, hello, everyone. Nothing to report, really. We've come to the Bifflesook Dam again. This is our second foray to this part of the reserve. And there are nothing, well, there is nothing there at the moment. 
which is uh, a sadness in my life, of course. As we get through these little trials, uh, we move along and see how things go. The darkness has fallen. This is half an account of the sun disappearing over the mountains and half an account of the thick uh, blanket of grey cloud that is covering us at the moment. We came back here hoping to see again if the um, slightly shy Gajima wouldn't pop out of the bush in front of us, and we're still hoping that that might be the case. But at least we've had a wonderful afternoon with Tingana. I'm very jealous of that, of course. Scott and I basically flipped a coin as to who was going to Arethusa today. Scott won, and there he is. And here I am. Now, there was a question earlier... Uh, there was a question... <laughs> Sorry, hold on. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> there was some um, talk of gin and tonics on safari, and Gracie, you want to know if you can have chocolate milk on safari, if you're on your night safari, rather than adult drinks. Of course you can, Gracie. You can have chocolate milk. You can have lime milk. You can have strawberry milk. You can have whatever kind of milk you like. Definitely. So if you ever come out here, we'll make sure there's a great big vat of chocolate milk sitting on the back of the car, and you can sip it at will. <laughs> no, no, no. Now, VM will join you. You might have to fight VM for it, though. We'll have to make VM his own chocolate milk, because he loves chocolate milk. <laughs> David, hello David Russell, you're in Oregon, and you want to know if I'm the only one who plays the guitar in the camp. I thought I was, until fairly recently, David. Um, I walked into the very quiet and very private Alexander Vosnesesky's room, and Alex, of course, is the technical genius who sorts out all of the, well, he's the reason you can see us, basically. And he is a very private Russian, a highly intelligent Russian, and he has guitar in his room, which nobody knew about. And so Alex plays a bit, but nobody's ever actually heard him play. So whether he's capable of plinking out a note or not, I don't know, but I can report that his guitar was in tune. Otherwise, I don't think there's anyone else. Well, there's certainly no one else who's prepared to admit it. Viam, you play, uh, you play the trumpet, don't you? Sometimes. Would you like to play something for us? No. Okay, he plays the he plays the mouth trumpet, everybody. He doesn't actually play the trumpet. Of course, the other very skilled musician in the camp is Brian Joubert. He's a quite phenomenal beatboxer. And, you know, you watch people beatbox and you think, well, oh, I'm sure I could do that. And uh, I promise you, you couldn't. It's really a very difficult thing to do, and it's incredibly impressive to, to see him in full flight, flow. There is the 78th Diker we've seen today, Vian. We'll just give it a quick shine on the bottom and then drive off. I've seen more Diker today than I've had hot breakfast. No one else. Oh, of course, Jamie plays the flute. <clears throat> well, she says she plays the flute. And if her brother's musicianship is anything to go by, I'm sure she was a very fine flautist. But she doesn't play very much at the moment which is a great sadness. Brent Leo Smith plays his voice excessively all the time. Scott plays the drums from time to time in a fairly irregular manner. Christine, I was given your question a little while back to try and think about. You want to know if there's anything in the bush that I've ever seen that I really cannot explain, something that completely defies explanation. There is, actually. I have just thought of something. And I'm sure many of you out there have seen it in various guises. It's the flight of enormous flocks of birds. Now, in many parts of the world, it's starlings. Out here, it's quilias, which are small finch-like birds. Well, they are small finches. And they fly around in flocks of millions, millions of birds. 
and something that science I don't believe has managed to explain satisfactorily is how those birds, those huge flocks of birds, and if you've never seen them, just have a look, just try to have a Google and have a look at them. And they fly in these incredible flocks moving like great big clouds of smoke all over the place and they never crash into each other. Certainly no birds fly out of it and how do they do it? Right, let's head across to Scott, he's still got the Tingana. Well, we found out what Tingana's been up to and it appears like there are some zebra that he was initially showing interest in. They did detect him. I've heard the snallion snorting at him and only now have we decided to turn the lights on. Just to give you a brief view of him up and mobile. But I think, for now, let's see if we can't get another view. I'm not sure if he's possibly interested in something else. It's tricky, we don't want to interfere in any way, but we, of course we want to view him on the move. So. If we do come across any potential prey, I'm just going to have to kill all the lights. So there's a prior warning as to what will happen. The reason why is obviously if we shine the lights on him, it'll give away his position. If we shine the lights on the prey, it will blind them. But let's just establish what's going on first. I last saw him moving at a rate of knots in this direction. If we don't have any luck on this little peruse that we're taking now, we will probably leave him be to try and do his business. I just got a glimpse of him. Sorry, Dave, it's just too thick in there. Let's just loop ahead and go and stand by on the boundary, which he's heading towards. Hello, Ben in Canada. You would like to know if jaguars will learn to hunt from their parents or will they in fact just learn from, well know from, from instinct, know from birth. And I am 100% under the belief that they will be able to instinctually know what to do in order to hunt. They don't need to be taught how to hunt, even though certain uh, predators will assist their youngsters in trying to do a little bit of teaching, especially cheetah, who will catch prey and keep it alive for their cubs to play with it. So yes, it is certainly possible, but it's not something that I've seen happening. These here, though, are leopards. They're not jaguars. We only, you only get jaguars in South America not where we are here. Just going to give it 10 seconds. If he doesn't pop out down this long, windy road, we will leave him be. I've got a feeling if he does continue towards us, this is where he's going to pop out. So we may get another glimpse of him. If not, I just want to leave him to his own devices. Good hunting conditions. There's a bit of a breeze blowing. Come on, Tingana, give us one more little glimpse. Oh. That was him calling. You may have heard that very loud vocalization. Awesome. Now, well, let's hope he pops out. I couldn't tell exactly where he was from that call, but he's somewhere off to our right and could pop out at any stage. Ollie in the UK, you would like to know if we've positively identified the other male leopard we saw the other day for the first time. No, uh, not me personally, but others do believe that it is a male called Gijima who spends time to the north of us, mainly on Buffalsook. He's been seen there, apparently he has been seen mating with Karula. Um, again though, um, this is just the thoughts of some of our viewers, who I'm not saying are wrong, but I haven't seen any comparison shots of the two of them next to one, them one another yet, so I haven't been able to confirm for myself if that is the case. The fact that we heard Tingana vocalize, now I'm not sure if you guys did, it may have been a little bit too far away, but it, it, it did, he did call, 
And you may have faintly heard that. And that indicates that he's no longer really interested in hunting. So, of course, if he was trying to stalk something, or what it may mean is that he tried to catch something, it ran away, and then he vocalized in disgust, almost saying, come on, you know, I've missed that opportunity. I have seen leopards doing that in the past. Let's continue. He was moving at a serious speed, and I think he could well pop out a little bit further west of us, close to, well, over the boundary between Arethusa and Juma. Well, I'm very happy that not only did we get to see Tsangana this evening, but got to see him up and on the move, even though it was just a very brief view of him. And it's not over yet. There's going to be another minute or so with me before you head back to James for him to say goodbye. And the good news is Tangana is heading towards Juma. So hopefully he's going to pop into the Juma waterhole tonight. You may see him there or we may find him first thing tomorrow morning. So those are some good prospects already. I'm hoping the Inkahuma lioness also decide to come back for a visit or at least to somewhere where we can view them. Anyway, it's been great fun. Thank you very much, everyone, for following, sending through your thoughts, questions, contributions. Well done to Leanne, who directed her first show today so you did a good job and well done to Nikki and everyone else in the final control room thanks very much Dave on camera we will see you all next time over to James bunny bunny we are bunny look bunny look bunny oh, it's gone. It hasn't gone what are you talking about man there it is there we go look everybody Vim and I found a mammal a little scrub hair feeding on the fresh green shoots. It's quite sweet, so we'll leave him to his sweetness. Just a few, well, less than, less than a few minutes left. So just quickly, I just wanted to finish my little thing on the, on the starlings and on the quelea birds. No one knows how those flocks of starlings and quelea fly around the way they do. There are various things about sensors on wings and perhaps a command bird that everyone watches. I don't believe it. I believe that they are suspended in a state where they don't perceive time in the same way that we do. And that's almost impossible to understand, but I think that there is some kind of quantum field that they are able to perceive that we are not and they're moving almost outside of the time as we perceive it. And I'm sure that's probably almost impossible to understand. Uh, I don't really understand it myself, but I just think it's incredible to see those quelea birds and starlings fly the way they do. So thank you, Christine, in North Carolina for that. Marvelous question from you. Right, that's it from us, everybody. A big thanks to Vim on camera. Thank you for your efforts. You didn't spot much today, but we really know, nor did I. Big thanks to Scott, of course, and the cat, thank goodness. He was with David. And, of course, to Leanne on her debut. Well done, Leanne. Good job today. Helped by Kirsty and Nikki. We will see you all tomorrow morning at 05.30. Until then, stay safe and happy, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.